Nicomachean Ethics, Book 3, Section 1. Since virtue is concerned with passions and actions, and on voluntary passions and actions, praise and blame are bestowed, on those that are involuntary pardon, and sometimes also pity, to distinguish the voluntary and the involuntary, is presumably necessary for those who are studying the nature of virtue, and also useful for legislators with a view to the assigning both of honors and of punishments. Those things, then, are thought involuntary, which take place under compulsion or owing to ignorance, and that is compulsory of which the moving principle is outside, being a principle in which nothing is contributed by the person who is acting or is feeling the passion. For example, if he were to be carried somewhere by a wind or by men who had him in their power. But with regard to the things that are done from fear or greater evils or for some noble object, for example, if a tyrant were to order one to do something base, having one's parents and children in his power, and if one did the action, they were to be saved, but otherwise would be put to death. It may be debated whether such actions are involuntary or voluntary. Something of the sort happens also with regard to the throwing of goods overboard in a storm. For in the abstract, no one throws goods away voluntarily. But on condition of its securing the safety of himself and his crew, any sensible man does so. Such actions, then, are mixed, but are more like voluntary actions, for they are worthy of choice at the time when they are done, and the end of an action is relative to the occasion. Both the terms, then, voluntary and involuntary, must be used with reference to the moment of action. Now, the man acts voluntarily, for the principle that moves the instrumental parts of the body in such actions is in him because it was in our power, however, to act in this way or not in this way. Therefore, the states are voluntary. And the things of which the moving principle is in a man himself are in his power to do or not to do. Such actions, therefore, are voluntary, but in the abstract, perhaps involuntary, for no one would choose any such act in itself. For such actions, men are sometimes even praised, when they endure something base or painful in return for great and noble objects gained. In the opposite case, they are blamed, since to endure the greatest indignities for no noble end or for a trifling end is the mark of an inferior person. On some actions, praise indeed is not bestowed, but pardon is. When one does what he ought not under pressure which overstrains human nature and which no one could withstand. But some acts, perhaps, we cannot be forced to do, but ought rather to face death after the most fearful sufferings. For the things that forced Euripides Alcmaon to slay his mother seem absurd. It is difficult sometimes to determine what should be chosen at what cost, and what should be endured in return for what gain, and yet more difficult to abide by our decisions. For as a rule, what is expected is painful, and what we are forced to do is base, whence praise and blame are bestowed on those who have been compelled or have not. What sorts of acts, then, should be called compulsory? We answer that without qualification actions are so when the cause is in the external circumstances and the agent contributes nothing. But the things that in themselves are involuntary, but now and in return for these gains are worthy of choice, and whose moving principle is in the agent, are in themselves involuntary, but now and in return for these gains, voluntary. They are more like voluntary acts, for actions are in the class of particulars, and the particular acts here are voluntary. What sorts of things are to be chosen, and in return for what, it is not easy to state, for there are many differences in the particular cases. But if someone were to say that pleasant and noble objects have a compelling power, forcing us from without, all acts would be for him compulsory. For it is for these objects that all men do everything they do. And those who act under compulsion and unwillingly act with pain, but those who do acts for their pleasantness and nobility do them with pleasure. It is absurd to make external circumstances responsible and not oneself, as being easily caught by such attractions, 
and to make oneself responsible for noble acts, but the pleasant objects responsible for base acts. The compulsory, then, seems to be that whose moving principle is outside, the person compelled contributing nothing. Everything that is done by reason of ignorance is not voluntary. It is only what produces pain and repentance that is involuntary. For the man who has done something owing to ignorance, and feels not the least vexation at his action, has not acted voluntarily, since he did not know what he was doing, nor yet involuntarily, since he is not pained. Of people, then, who act by reason of ignorance, he who repents is thought an involuntary agent, and the man who does not repent may, since he is different, be called a not voluntary agent. For since he differs from the other, it is better that he should have a name of his own. Acting by reason of ignorance seems also to be different from acting in ignorance. For the man who is drunk or in a rage is thought to act as a result not of ignorance, but of one of the causes mentioned, yet not knowingly, but in ignorance. Now every wicked man is ignorant of what he ought to do and what he ought to abstain from. And it is by reason of error of this kind that men become unjust and in general bad. But the term involuntary tends to be used not if a man is ignorant of what is to his advantage. For it is not mistaken purpose that causes involuntary action. It leads rather to wickedness, nor ignorance of the universal, for that men are blamed. But ignorance of particulars. In other words, of the circumstances of the action and the objects with which it is concerned. For it is on these that both pity and pardon depend. Since the person who is ignorant of any of these acts involuntarily. Perhaps it is just as well, therefore, to determine their nature and number. A man may be ignorant, then, of who he is, what he is doing, what or whom he is acting on, and sometimes also what, for example, what instrument he is doing it with, and to what end. For example, he may think his act will conduce to someone's safety and how he is doing it, for example, whether gently or violently. Now, of all of these, no one could be ignorant unless he were mad, and evidently also he could not be ignorant of the agent, for how could he not know himself? But of what he is doing a man might be ignorant, as for instance people say it slipped out of their mouths as they were speaking, or they did not know it was a secret, as Aeschylus said of the mysteries, or a man might say he let it go off when he merely wanted to show its working, as the man did with the catapult. Again, one might think one's son was an enemy, as Mirope did, or that a pointed spear had a button on it, or that a stone was pumice stone, or one might give a man a drop to save him and really kill him, or one might want to touch a man, as people do in sparring, and really wound him. The ignorance may relate, then, to any of these things, in other words, of the circumstances of the action, and the man who is ignorant of any of these is thought to have acted involuntarily, especially if he was ignorant on the most important points. And these are thought to be the circumstances of the action and its end. Further, the doing of an act that is called involuntary in virtue of ignorance of this sort must be painful and involve repentance. Since that which is done under compulsion, or by reason of ignorance, is involuntary, the voluntary would seem to be that of which the moving principle is in the agent himself, he being aware of the particular circumstances of the action. Presumably, acts done by reason of anger or appetite are not rightly called involuntary. For in the first place, on that showing none of the other animals will act voluntarily, nor will children. And secondly, is it meant that we do not voluntarily do any of the acts that are due to appetite or anger, or that we do the noble acts voluntarily and the base acts involuntarily? Is not this absurd when one and the same thing is the cause? But it would surely be odd to describe as involuntary the things one ought to desire. And we ought both to be angry at certain things and to have an appetite for certain things, for example, for health and for learning. Also, what is involuntary is thought to be painful, but what is in accordance with appetite is thought to be pleasant. Again, what is the difference in respect of involuntariness between errors committed upon calculation and those committed in anger? Both are to be avoided, but the irrational passions are thought not less human than reason is. 
and therefore also the actions which proceed from anger or appetite are the man's actions. It would be odd, then, to treat them as involuntary. Section 2. Both the involuntary and the voluntary have been delimited. We must next discuss choice. For it is thought to be most closely bound up with virtue and to discriminate characters better than actions do. Choice, then, seems to be voluntary, but not the same thing as the voluntary. The latter extends more widely. For both children and the lower animals share involuntary action, but not in choice. And acts done on the spur of the moment we describe as voluntary, but not as chosen. Those who say it is appetite or anger or wish or a kind of opinion do not seem to be right. For choice is not common to irrational creatures as well, but appetite and anger are. Again, the incontinent man acts with appetite, but not with choice while the continent man, on the contrary, acts with choice, but not with appetite. Again, appetite is contrary to choice, but not appetite to appetite. Again, appetite relates to the pleasant and the painful, choice neither to the painful nor to the pleasant. Still less is it anger, for acts due to anger are thought to be less than any other objects of choice. But neither is it wish, though it seems near to it, for choice cannot relate to impossibles, and if anyone said he chose them, he would be thought silly. But there may be a wish even for impossibles, for example, for immortality. And wish may relate to things that could in no way be brought about by one's own efforts. For example, that a particular actor or athlete should win in a competition. But no one chooses such things, but only the things that he thinks could be brought about by his own efforts. Again, wish relates rather to the end, choice to the means. For instance, we wish to be healthy, but we choose the acts which will make us healthy. And we wish to be happy and say we do, but we cannot well say we choose to be so. For, in general, choice seems to relate to the things that are in our own power. For this reason, too, it cannot be opinion. For opinion is thought to relate to all kinds of things no less to eternal things and impossible things than to things in our own power. And it is distinguished by its falsity or truth, not by its badness or goodness, while choice is distinguished rather by these. Now, with opinion in general, perhaps no one even says it is identical. But it is not identical, even with any kind of opinion. For by choosing what is good or bad, we are men of a certain character which we are not by holding certain opinions. And we choose to get or avoid something good or bad, but we have opinions about what a thing is or whom it is good for or how it is good for him. We can hardly be said to opine to get or avoid anything. And a choice is praised for being related to the right object rather than for being rightly related to it. Opinion for being truly related to its object. And we choose what we best know to be good, but we opine what we do not quite know. And it is not the same people that are thought to make the best choices and to have the best opinions, but some are thought to have fairly good opinions, but by reason of vice to choose what they should not. If opinion precedes choice or accompanies it, that makes no difference, for it is not this that we are considering, but whether it is identical with some kind of opinion. What, then, or what kind of thing is it, since it is none of the things we have mentioned? It seems to be voluntary, but not all that is voluntary to be an object of choice. Is it, then, what has been decided on by a previous deliberation? At any rate, choice involves a rational principle and thought. Even the name seems to suggest that it is what is chosen before other things. Section 3. Do we deliberate about everything, and is everything a possible subject of deliberation, or is deliberation impossible about some things? We ought presumably to call not what a fool or a madman would deliberate about, but what a sensible man would deliberate about, a subject of deliberation. Now about eternal things no one deliberates, for example, about the material universe or the incommensurability of the diagonal and the side of a square. 
but no more do we deliberate about the things that involve movement, but always happen in the same way, whether of necessity, or by nature, or from any other cause. For example, the solstices and the risings of the stars. Nor about things that happen now in one way, now in another. For example, droughts and rains. Nor about chance events, like the finding of treasure. But we do not deliberate even about all human affairs. For instance, no Spartan deliberates about the best constitution for the Scythians. For none of these things can be brought about by our own efforts. We deliberate about things that are in our power and can be done. And these are, in fact, what is left. For nature, necessity and chance are thought to be causes. And also reason and everything that depends on man. Now every class of men deliberates about the things that can be done by their own efforts. And in the case of exact and self-contained sciences, there is no deliberation. For example, about the letters of the alphabet, for we have no doubt how they should be written. But the things that are brought about by our own efforts, but not always in the same way, are the things about which we deliberate. For example, questions of medical treatment or of money-making. And we do so more in the case of the art of navigation than in that of gymnastics, inasmuch as it has been less exactly worked out, and again about other things in the same ratio, and more also in the case of the arts than in that of the sciences, for we have more doubt about the former. Deliberation is concerned with things that happen in a certain way for the most part, but in which the event is obscure, and with things in which it is indeterminate. We call on others to aid us in deliberation on important questions, distrusting ourselves as not being equal to deciding. We deliberate not about ends, but about means. For a doctor does not deliberate whether he shall heal, nor an orator whether he shall persuade, nor a statesman whether he shall produce law and order, nor does anyone else deliberate about his end. They assume the end and consider how and by what means it is to be attained. And if it seems to be produced by several means, they consider by which it is most easily and best produced. While if it is achieved by one, only they consider how it will be achieved by this, and by what means this will be achieved, till they come to the first cause, which in the order of discovery is last. For the person who deliberates seems to investigate and analyze in the way they described as though he were analyzing a geometrical construction. Not all investigation appears to be deliberation, for, ex for instance, mathematical investigations, but all deliberation is investigation. And what is last in the order of analysis seems to be first in the order of becoming. And if we come on an impossibility, we give up the search. For example, if we need money and this cannot be got. But if a thing appears possible, we try to do it. By possible things, I mean things that might be brought about by our own efforts. And these, in a sense, include things that can be brought about by the efforts of our friends, since the moving principle is in ourselves. The subject of investigation is sometimes the instruments, sometimes the use of them. And similarly, in the other cases, sometimes the means, sometimes the mode of using it, or the means of bringing it about. It seems then, as has been said, that man is a moving principle of actions. Now deliberation is about the things to be done by the agent himself, and actions are for the sake of things other than themselves. For the end cannot be a subject of deliberation, but only the means. Nor indeed can the particular facts be a subject of it, as whether this is bread or has been baked as it should, for these are matters of perception. And if we are to be always deliberating, we shall have to go on to infinity. The same thing is deliberated upon and is chosen, except that the object of choice is already determinate, since it is that which has been decided upon as a result of deliberation that is the object of choice. For everyone ceases to inquire how he is to act when he has brought the moving principle back to himself, and to the ruling part of himself, for this is what chooses. This is plain also from the ancient constitutions, which Homer represented. For the kings announced their choices to the people. The object of choice being one of the things in our own power which is desired after deliberation, 
Choice will be deliberate desire of things in our own power. For when we have decided as a result of deliberation, we desire in accordance with our deliberation. We may take it, then, that we have described choice in outline, and stated the nature of its objects, and the fact that it is concerned with means. Section 4. That wish is for the end has already been stated. Some think it is for the good, others for the apparent good. Now those who say that good is the object of wish must admit in consequence that that which the man who does not choose a right wishes for is not an object of wish. For if it is to be so, it must also be good. But it was, if it so happened, bad. While those who say the apparent good is the object of wish must admit that there is no natural object of wish, but only what seems good to each man. Now different things appear good to different people, and if it so happens, even contrary things. If these consequences are unpleasing, are we to say that absolutely and in truth the good is the object of wish, but for each person the apparent good? That that which is in truth an object of wish is an object of wish to the good man, while any chance thing may be so the bad man, as in the case of bodies. Also the things that are in truth wholesome are wholesome for bodies which are in good condition which for those that are diseased, other things are wholesome, or bitter, or sweet, or hot, or heavy, and so on. Since the good man judges each class of things rightly, and in each the truth appears to him. For each state of character has its own ideas of the noble and the pleasant. And perhaps the good man differs from others, most by seeing the truth in each class of things, being, as it were, the norm and measure of them. In most things, the error seems to be due to pleasure, for it appears a good when it is not. We therefore choose the pleasant as a good, and avoid pain as an evil. Section 5. The end, then, being what we wish for, the means what we deliberate about and choose. Actions concerning means must be according to choice and voluntary. Now the exercise of the virtues is concerned with means. Therefore, virtue also is in our own power, and so too vice. For where it is in our power to act, it is also in our power not to act, and vice versa. So that, if to act, where this is noble, is in our power, not to act, which will be base, will also be in our power. And if not to act, where this is noble, is in our power, to act, which will be base, will also be in our power. Now, if it is in our power to do noble or base acts, and likewise in our power not to do them, and this was what being good or bad meant, then it is in our power to be virtuous or vicious. The saying that no one is voluntarily wicked nor involuntarily happy seems to be partly false and partly true. For no one is involuntarily happy, but wickedness is voluntary or else we shall have to dispute what has just been said, at any rate, and deny that man is a moving principle, or begetter of his actions, as of children. But if these facts are evident, and we cannot refer actions to moving principles, other than those in ourselves, the acts whose moving principles are in us must themselves also be in our power and voluntary. Witness seems to be born to this both by individuals, in their private capacity, and by legislators themselves. For these punish and take vengeance on those who do wicked acts, unless they have acted under compulsion, or as a result of ignorance for which they are not themselves responsible, while they honor those who do noble acts, as though they meant to encourage the latter and deter the former. But no one is encouraged to do the things that are neither in our power nor voluntary. It is assumed that there is no gain in being persuaded not to be hot or in pain or hungry or the like, since we shall experience these feelings nonetheless. Indeed, we punish a man for his very ignorance, if he is thought responsible for the ignorance, as when penalties are doubled in the case of drunkenness. For the moving principle is in the man himself, since he had the power of not getting drunk, and his getting drunk was the cause of his ignorance. And we punish those who are ignorant of anything in the laws that they ought to know, and that is not difficult. 
and so too in the case of anything else that they are thought to be ignorant of through carelessness. We assume that it is in their power not to be ignorant, since they have the power of taking care. But perhaps a man is the same kind of man not to take care. Still they are themselves, by their slack lives, responsible for becoming men of that kind, and men make themselves responsible for being unjust or self-indulgent. In the one case, by cheating, and in the other, by spending their time in drinking bouts and the like. For it is activities exercised on particular objects that make the corresponding character. This is plain from the case of people training for any contest or action. They practice activity the whole time. Now, not to know that it is from the exercise of activities on particular objects that states of character are produced is the mark of a thoroughly senseless person. Again, it is irrational to suppose that a man who acts unjustly does not wish to be unjust, or a man who acts self-indulgently to be self-indulgent. But if, without being ignorant, a man does the things which will make him unjust, he will be unjust voluntarily. Yet it does not follow that if he wishes, he will cease to be unjust and will be just. For neither does the man who is ill become well on those terms. We may suppose a case in which he is ill voluntarily, through living incontinently and disobeying his doctors. In that case, it was then open to him not to be ill, but not now, when he has thrown away his chance, just as when you have let a stone go, it is too late to recover it. But yet it was in your power to throw it, since the moving principle was in you. So too, to the unjust and to the self-indulgent man, it was open at the beginning not to become men of this kind. And so they are unjust and self-indulgent voluntarily. But now that they have become so, it is not possible for them not to be so. But not only are the vices of the soul voluntary, but those of the body also for some men, whom we accordingly blame. While no one blames those who are ugly by nature, we blame those who are so owing to want of exercise and care. So it is, too, with respect to weakness and infirmity. No one would reproach a man blind from birth or by disease or from a blow, but rather pity him, while everyone would blame a man who is blind from drunkenness or some other form of self-indulgence. Of vices of the body, then, those in our power are blamed. Those not in our power are not. And if this be so, in the other cases, also the vices that are blamed must be in our own power. Now someone may say that all men desire the apparent good, but have no control over the appearance, but the end appears to each man in a form answering to his character. We reply that if each man is somehow responsible for his state of mind, he will also be himself somehow responsible for the appearance. But if not, no one is responsible for his own evil doing, but everyone does evil acts through ignorance of the end, thinking that by these he will get what is best. And the aiming at that end is not self-chosen, but one must be born with an eye, as it were, by which to judge rightly and choose what is truly good. And he is well endowed by nature, who is well endowed with this. For it is what is greatest and most noble, and what we cannot get or learn from another, but must have just such as it was when given us at birth. And to be well and nobly endowed with this will be perfect and true excellence of natural endowment. If this is true, then, how will virtue be more voluntary than vice? To both men alike, the good and the bad, the end appears and is fixed by nature or however it may be, and it is by referring everything else to this that men do whatever they do. Whether, then, it is not by nature that the end appears to each man, such as it does appear, but something also depends on him, or the end is natural, but because the good man adopts the means voluntarily, virtue is voluntary, Vice also will be nonetheless voluntary. For in the case of the bad man, there is equally present that which depends on himself in his actions, even if not in his end. If then, as is asserted, the virtues are voluntary, for we are ourselves somehow partly responsible for our states of character, and it is by being persons of a certain kind that we assume the end to be so and so, the vices also will be voluntary for the same is true of them. With regard to the virtues in general, we have stated their genus in outline, vis-a-vis -vis that they are means and that they are a state of character. 
and that they tend, and by their own nature, to the doing of the acts by which they are produced, and that they are in our power and voluntary, and act as the right rule prescribes. But actions and states of character are not voluntary in the same way, for we are masters of our actions from the beginning right to the end. If we know the particular facts, but though we control the beginning of our states of character, the gradual progress is not obvious any more than it is in illnesses. Because it is in our power, however, to act in this way or not in this way, therefore the states are voluntary. Let us take up the several virtues, however, and say which they are, and what sorts of things they are concerned with, and how they are concerned with them. At the same time, it will become plain how many they are. And first, let us speak of courage. Section 6. That it is a mean with regards to feelings of fear and confidence has already been made evident. And plainly, the things we fear are terrible things, and these are, to speak without qualification, evils. For which reason people even define fear as expectation of evil. Now, we fear all evils, for example, disgrace, poverty, disease, friendlessness, death, but the brave man is not thought to be concerned with all, for to fear some things is even right and noble, and it is base not to fear them, for example, disgrace. He who fears this is good and modest, and he who does not is shameless. He is, however, by what some people called brave, by a transference of the word to a new meaning. For he has in him something which is like the brave man, since the brave man also is a fearless person. Poverty and disease we perhaps ought not to fear, for nor in general the things that do not proceed from vice and are not due to a man himself. But not even the man who is fearless of these is brave. Yet we apply the word to him also in virtue of a similarity. For some who in the dangers of war are cowards and liberal and are confident in the face of the loss of money. Nor is a man a coward if he fears insult to his wife and children, or envy, or anything of the kind. Nor brave if he is confident when he is about to be flogged. With what sort of terrible things, then, is the brave man concerned? Surely with the greatest, for no one is more likely than he to stand his ground against what is awe-inspiring. Now death is the most terrible of all things, for it is the end, and nothing is thought to be any longer either good or bad for the dead. But the brave man would not seem to be concerned even with death in all circumstances, for example, at sea or in disease. In what circumstances, then? Surely in the noblest. Now such deaths are those in battle, for these take place in the greatest and noblest danger. And these are correspondingly honored in city-states and at the courts of monarchs. Properly, then, he will be called brave who is fearless in face of a noble death. And of all emergencies that involve death, and the emergencies of war, are in the highest degree of this field. Yet at sea also, and in disease, the brave man is fearless, but not in the same way as the seaman. For he has given up hope of safety, and is disliking the thought of death in this shape, while they are hopeful because of their experience. At the same time, we show courage in situations where there is the opportunity of showing prowess or where death is noble. But in these forms of death, neither of these conditions is fulfilled. Section 7. What is terrible is not the same for all men, but we say there are things terrible even beyond human strength. These, then, are terrible to everyone, at least to every sensible man. But the terrible things that are not beyond human strength differ in magnitude and degree. And so, too, do the things that inspire confidence. Now, the brave man is as dauntless as man may be. Therefore, while he will fear even the things that are not beyond human strength, he will face them as he ought and, the rule, and as the rule directs, for honor's sake. For this is the end of virtue. But it is possible to fear these more or less, and again to fear things that are not terrible as if they were. Of the faults that are committed, one consists in fearing what one should not, another in fearing as we should not, another in fearing when we should not, and so on. And so too with respect to the things that inspire confidence. 
The man, then, who faces and who fears the right things, and from the right motive, in the right way and from the right time, and who feels confidence under the corresponding conditions, is brave. For the brave man feels and acts according to the merits of the case and in whatever way the rule directs. Now the end of every activity is conformity to the corresponding state of character. This is true, therefore, of the brave man as well as of others. But courage is noble, therefore the end also is noble. For each thing is defined by its end. Therefore it is for a noble end that the brave man endures and acts as courage directs. Of those who go to excess, he who exceeds in fearlessness has no name. We have said previously that many states of character have no names, but he would be a sort of madman or insensible person if he feared nothing, neither earthquakes nor the waves, as they say the Celts do not. While the man who exceeds in confidence about what really is terrible is rash. The rash man, however, is also thought to be boastful and only a pretender to courage. At all events, as the brave man is with regard to what is terrible, so the rash man wishes to appear and so he imitates him in situations where he can. Hence also, most of them are a mixture of rashness and cowardice. For while in these situations they display confidence, they do not hold their ground against what is really terrible. The man who exceeds in fear is a coward, for he fears both what he ought not and as he ought not, and all the similar characterizations attached to him. He is lacking also in confidence but he is more conspicuous for his excess of fear in painful situations. The coward, then, is a despairing sort of person, for he fears everything. The brave man, on the other hand, has the opposite disposition, for confidence is the mark of a hopeful disposition. The coward, the rash man, and the brave man, then, are concerned with the same objects, but are differently disposed towards them, for the first two exceed and fall short, while the third holds the middle which is the right position. And rash men are precipitate, and wish for dangers beforehand, but draw back when they are in them, while brave men are keen in the moment of action, but quiet beforehand. As we have said, then, courage is a mean with respect to things that inspire confidence or fear. In the circumstances that have been stated, and it chooses or endures things because it is noble to do so, or because it is base not to do so, but to die to escape from poverty or love or anything painful is not the mark of a brave man, but rather of a coward. For it is softness to fly from what is troublesome. And such a man endures death not because it is noble, but to fly from evil. Section 8. Courage, then, is something of this sort, but the name is also applied to five other kinds. First comes the courage of the citizen soldier. For this is most like true courage. Citizen soldiers seem to face dangers because of the penalties imposed by the laws and the reproaches they would otherwise incur, and because of the honors they win by such action. And therefore, those peoples seem to be bravest among whom cowards are held in dishonor and brave men in honor. This is the kind of courage that Homer depicts, for example, in Diomede and in Hector. First will Polydamas be to heap reproach on me then, and for Hector one day mid the Trojans shall utter his vaulting harangue. Afraid was Tydides and fled from my face. This kind of courage is most like to that which we described earlier, because it is due to virtue. For it is due to shame and to desire of a noble object, in other words, honor, and avoidance of disgrace, which is ignoble. One might rank in the same class even those who are compelled by their rulers, but they are inferior inasmuch as they do what they do not from shame but from fear, and to avoid not what is disgraceful but what is painful, for their masters compel them, as Hector does. But if I shall spy any dastard who cowers far from the fight, vainly will such an one hope to escape from the dogs. And those who give them their posts and beat them if they retreat do the same. And so do those who draw them up with trenches or something of the sort behind them. All of these apply compulsion. But one ought to be brave not under compulsion, but because it is noble to do so. 2. 
Experience with regard to particular facts is also thought to be courage. And this is indeed the reason why Socrates thought courage was knowledge. Other people exhibit this quality in other dangers, and professional soldiers exhibit it in the dangers of war. For there seem to be many empty alarms in war, of which these have had the most comprehensive experience. Therefore, they seem brave, because the others do not know the nature of the facts. Again, their experience makes them most capable in attack and in defense, since they can use their arms and have the kind that are likely to be best both for attack and for defense. Therefore, they fight like armed men against unarmed, or like trained athletes against amateurs. For in such contests, too, it is not the bravest men that fight best, but those who are strongest and have their bodies in the best condition. Professional soldiers turn cowards, however, when the danger puts too great a strain on them, and they are inferior in numbers and equipment. For they are the first to fly, while citizen forces die at their posts, as, in fact, happened at the Temple of Hermes. For to the latter, flight is disgraceful, and death is preferable to safety on those terms. While the former, from the very beginning, face the danger on the assumption that they were stronger, and when they know the facts, they fly, fearing death more than disgrace. But the brave man is not that sort of person. 3. Passion also is sometimes reckoned as courage. Those who act from passion, like wild beasts rushing at those who have wounded them, are thought to be brave, because brave men also are passionate. For passion, above all things, is eager to rush on danger. And hence Homer's put strength into his passion, and aroused their spirit and passion, and hard he breathed panting, and his blood boiled. For all such expressions seem to indicate the stirring and onset of passion. Now brave men act for honor's sake, but passion aids them, while wild beasts act under the influence of pain, for they attack because they have been wounded, or because they are afraid. Since if they are in a forest, they do not come near one. Thus they are not brave because, driven by pain and passion, they rush on danger without foreseeing any of the perils. Since at that rate, even asses would be brave when they are hungry, for blows will not drive them from their food. And lust also makes adulterers do many daring things. Those creatures are not brave, then, which are driven on to danger by pain or passion. The courage that is due to passion seems to be the most natural and to be courage if choice and motive be added. Men, then, as well as beasts, suffer pain when they are angry, and are pleased when they exact their revenge. Those who fight for these reasons, however, are pugnacious but not brave, for they do not act for honor's sake, nor as the rule directs, but from strength of feeling. They have, however, something akin to courage. 4. Nor are sanguine people brave, for they are confident in danger only because they have conquered often and against many foes. Yet they closely resemble brave men, because both are confident. But brave men are confident for the reasons stated earlier. While these are so, because they think they are the strongest and can suffer nothing. Drunken men also behave in this way. They become sanguine. When their adventures do not succeed, however, they run away. But it was the mark of a brave man to face things that are and seem terrible for a man, because it is noble to do so and disgraceful not to do so. Hence also it is thought the mark of a braver man to be fearless and undisturbed in sudden alarms than to be so in those that are foreseen. For it must have proceeded from uh, more from a state of character, because less from preparation. Acts that are foreseen may be chosen by calculation and rule. But sudden actions must be in accordance with one's state of character. 5. People who are ignorant of the danger also appear brave, and they are not far removed from those of a sanguine temper, but are inferior inasmuch as they have no self-reliance while these have. Hence also the sanguine hold their ground for a time. But those who have been deceived about the facts fly if they know or suspect that these are different from what they supposed as happened to the Argives when they fell in with the Spartans and took them for Sicyonians. We have then described the character both of brave men and of those who are thought to be brave. Section 9. Though courage is concerned with feelings of confidence and of fear, 
It is not concerned with both alike, but more with the things that inspire fear. For he who is undisturbed in face of these, and bears himself as he should towards these, is more truly brave than the man who does so towards the things that inspire confidence. It is for facing what is painful, then, as has been said, that men are called brave. Hence also courage involves pain, and is justly praised. For it is harder to face what is painful than to abstain from what is pleasant. Yet the end which courage sets before it would seem to be pleasant, but to be concealed by the attending circumstances, as happens also in athletic contests. For the end at which boxers aim is pleasant, the crown and the honors, but the blows they take are distressing to flesh and blood, and painful, and so is their whole exertion. And because the blows and the exertions are many the end, which is but small, appears to have nothing pleasant in it. And so, if the case of courage is similar, death and wounds will be painful to the brave man and against his will, but he will face them because it is noble to do so or because it is base not to do so. And the more he is possessed of virtue in its entirety, and the happier he is, the more he will be pained at the thought of death. For life is best worth living for such a man, and he is knowingly losing the greatest goods, and this is painful. But he is nonetheless brave, and perhaps all the more so, because he chooses noble deeds of war at that cost. It is not the case, then, with all the virtues, that the exercise of them is pleasant, except in so far as it reaches its end. But it is quite possible that the best soldiers may be not men of this sort, but those who are less brave but have no other good. For these are ready to face danger, and they sell their life for trifling gains. So much then for courage. It is not difficult to grasp its nature in outline, at any rate from what has been said. Section 10. After courage, let us speak of temperance, for these seem to be the virtues of the irrational parts. We have said that temperance is a mean with regards to pleasure, for it is less and not in the same way concerned with pains. Self-indulgence also is manifested in the same sphere. Now, therefore, let us determine with what sort of pleasures they are concerned. We may assume the distinction between bodily pleasures and those of the soul, such as love of honor and love of learning. For the lover of each of these delights in that of which he is a lover, the body being in no way affected, but rather the mind. But men who are concerned with such pleasures are called neither temperate nor self-indulgent. Nor, again, are those who are concerned with the other pleasures that are not bodily. For those who are fond of hearing and telling stories, and who spend their days on anything that turns up, are called gossips, but not self-indulgent. Nor are those who are pained at the loss of money or of friends. Temperance must be concerned with bodily pleasures, but not all even of these. For those who delight in objects of vision, such as colors and shapes in painting, are called neither temperate nor self-indulgent. Yet it would seem possible to delight even in these, as one should, or to excess, or to a deficient degree. And so too it is with objects of hearing. No one calls those who delight extravagantly in music or acting self-indulgent, nor those who do so as they ought temperate. Nor do we apply these names to those who delight in odor, unless it be incidentally. We do not call those self-indulgent who delight in the odor of apples or roses or incense, but rather those who delight in the odor of unguents or of dainty dishes. For self-indulgent people delight in these because these remind them of the objects of their appetite. And one may see even other people, when they are hungry, delighting in the smell of food. But to delight in this kind of thing is the mark of the self-indulgent man, for these are objects of appetite to him. Nor is there in animals, other than man, any pleasure connected with these senses, except incidentally. For dogs do not delight in the scent of hares, but in the eating of them. But the scent told them the hares were there. Nor does the lion delight in the lowing of the ox, but in eating it. But he perceived by the lowing that it was near, and therefore appears to delight in the lowing. And similarly, he does not delight because he sees a stag or a wild goat but because he is going to make a meal of it. Temperance and self-indulgence, however, are concerned with the kind of pleasures that the other animals share in, which therefore appear slavish and brutish. These are touch and taste. 
but even of taste they appear to make little or no use. For the business of taste is the discriminating of flavors, which is done by wine tasters and people who season dishes. But they hardly take pleasure in making these discriminations, or at least self-indulgent people do not, but in the actual enjoyment, which in all cases comes through touch, both in the case of food and in that of drink and in that of sexual intercourse. This is why a certain gourmand prayed that his throat might become longer than a crane's, implying that it was the contact that he took pleasure in. Thus, the sense with which self-indulgence is connected is the most widely shared of the senses, and self-indulgence would seem to be justly a matter of reproach, because it attaches to us not as men, but as animals. To delight in such things, then, and to love them above all others, is brutish. For even of the pleasures of touch, the most liberal have been eliminated. For example, those produced in the gymnasium by rubbing and by the consequent heat. For the contact characteristic of the self-indulgent man does not affect the whole body, but only certain parts. Section 11. Of the appetites, some seem to be common, others to be peculiar to individuals, and acquired. For example, the appetite for food is natural, since everyone who is without it craves for food or drink, or sometimes for both, and for love also, as Homer says, if he is young and lusty. But not everyone craves for this or that kind of nourishment or love, nor for the same things. Hence, such craving appears to be our very own. Yet it has, of course, something natural about it, for different things are pleasant to different kinds of people, and some things are more pleasant to everyone than chance objects. Now, in the natural appetites, few go wrong, and only in one direction, that of excess. For to eat or drink whatever offers itself till one is surfeited is to exceed the natural amount, since natural appetite is the replenishment of one's deficiency. Hence, these people are called belly gods, this implying that they fill their belly beyond what is right. It is people of entirely slavish character that become like this. But with regard to the pleasures peculiar to individuals, many people go wrong and in many ways. For while the people who are fond of so-and-so are so called because they delight either in the wrong things, or more than most people do, or in the wrong way, the self-indulgent exceed in all three ways. They both delight in some things that they ought not to delight in, since they are hateful. And if one ought to delight in some of the things they delight in, they do so more than one ought, and than most men do. Plainly, then, excess with regard to pleasures is self-indulgence and is culpable. With regard to pains, one is not, as in the case of courage, called temperate for facing them, or self-indulgent for not doing so. But the self-indulgent man is so called because he is pained more than he ought at not getting pleasant things, even his pain being caused by pleasure. And the temperate man is so called because he is not pained at the absence of what is pleasant and at his abstinence from it. The self-indulgent man, then, craves for all pleasant things, or those that are most pleasant, and is led by his appetite to choose these at the cost of everything else. Hence he is pained both when he fails to get them and when he is merely craving for them, for appetite involves pain. But it seems absurd to be pained for the sake of pleasure. People who fall short with regard to pleasures and delight in them less than they should are hardly found, for such insensibility is not human. Even the other animals distinguish different kinds of food and enjoy some and not others. And if there is anyone who finds nothing pleasant and nothing more attractive than anything else, he must be something quite different from a man. This sort of person has not received a name because he hardly occurs. The temperate man occupies a middle position with regard to these objects, for he neither enjoys the things that the self-indulgent man enjoys most, but rather dislikes them, nor in general the things that he should not, nor anything of this sort to excess, nor does he feel pain or craving when they are absent or does so only to a moderate degree, and not more than he should, nor when he should not, and so on. But the things that, being pleasant, make for health or for good condition, he will desire moderately, and as he should, and also other pleasant things if they are not hindrances to these ends, or contrary to what is noble, or beyond his means. For he who neglects these conditions loves such pleasures more than they are worth, but the temperate man is not that sort of person, but the sort of person that the right rule prescribes. 
Self-indulgence is more like a voluntary state than cowardice. For the former is actuated by pleasure, the latter by pain, of which the one is to be chosen and the other to be avoided. And pain upsets and destroys the nature of the person who feels it, while pleasure does nothing of the sort. Therefore, self-indulgence is more voluntary. Hence, also, it is more a matter of reproach, for it is easier to become accustomed to its objects, since there are many things of this sort in life, and the process of habituation to them is free from danger, while with terrible objects the reverse is the case. But a cowardice would seem to be voluntary in a different degree from its particular manifestations, for it is itself painless. But in these we are upset by pain, so that we even throw down our arms and disgrace ourselves in other ways. Hence our acts are even thought to be done under compulsion. For the self-indulgent man, on the other hand, the particular acts are voluntary, for he does them with craving and desire. But the whole state is less so, for no one craves to be self-indulgent. The name self-indulgence is applied also to childish faults, for they bear a certain resemblance to what we have been considering. Which is called after which makes no difference to our present purpose. Plainly, however, the latter is called after the earlier. The transference of the name seems not a bad one, for that which desires what is base and which develops quickly ought to be kept in a chastened condition. And these characteristics belong above all to appetite and to the child, since children, in fact, live at the beck and call of appetite, and it is in them that the desire for what is pleasant is strongest. If, then, it is not going to be obedient and subject to the ruling principle, it will go to great lengths. For in an irrational being, the desire for pleasure is insatiable even if it tries every source of gratification, and the exercise of appetite increases its innate force. And if appetites are strong and violent, they even expel the power of calculation. Hence, they should be moderate and few, and should in no way oppose the rational principle. And this is what we call an obedient and chastened state. And as the child should live accordingly to the direction of his tutor, so the appetitive element should live according to the rational principle. Hence, the appetitive element in a temperate man should harmonize with the rational principle. For the noble is the mark at which both aim. And the temperate man craves for the things he ought, as he ought, as when he ought. And when he ought, and this is what rational principle directs. Here we conclude our account of temperance. Book 4, Section 1. Let us speak next of liberality. It seems to be the mean with regard to wealth. For the liberal man is praised not in respect of military matters, nor of those in respect of which the temperate man is praised, nor of judicial decisions, but with regard to the giving and taking of wealth, and especially in respect of giving. Now, by wealth, we mean all the things whose value is measured by money. Further, prodigality and meanness are excesses and defects with regard to wealth. And meanness we always impute to those who care more than they ought for wealth. But we sometimes apply the word prodigality in a complex sense. For we call those men prodigals who are incontinent and spend money on self-indulgence. Hence also they are thought the poorest characters, for they combine more vices than one. Therefore the application of the word to them is not its proper use. For a prodigal means a man who has a single evil quality, that of wasting his substance since a prodigal is one who is being ruined by his own fault, and the wasting of substance is thought to be a sort of ruining of oneself, life being held to depend on possession of substance. This, then, is the sense in which we take the word prodigality. Now, the things that have a use may be used either well or badly, and riches is a useful thing, and everything is used best by the man who has the virtue concerned with it. Riches, therefore, will be used best by the man who has the virtue concerned with wealth. And this is the liberal man. Now, spending and giving seem to be the using of wealth, taking and keeping, rather, the possession of it. Hence, it is more the mark of the liberal man to give to the right people than to take from the right sources and not to take from the wrong. For it is more characteristic of virtue to do good than to have good done to one and more characteristic to do what is noble 
than not to do what is base. And it is not hard to see that giving implies doing good and doing what is noble, and taking implies having good done to one or not acting basely. And gratitude is felt towards him who gives, not towards him who does not take, and praise also is bestowed more on him. It is easier also not to take than to give, for men are apter to give away their own too little than to take what is another's. Givers, too, are called liberal. But those who do not take are not praised for liberality, but rather for justice, while those who take are hardly praised at all. And the liberal are almost the most loved of all virtuous characters, since they are useful, and this depends on their giving. Now virtuous actions are noble and done for the sake of the noble. Therefore the liberal man, like other virtuous men, will give for the sake of the noble, and rightly. For he will give to the right people the right amounts and at the right time, with all the other qualifications that accompany right giving, and that too with pleasure or without pain. For that which is virtuous is pleasant or free from pain. Least of all will it be painful. But he who gives to the wrong people, or not for the sake of the noble, but for some other cause, will not be called liberal, but by some other name. Nor is he liberal who gives with pain, for he would prefer the wealth to the noble act, and this is not characteristic of a liberal man. But no more will the liberal man take from wrong sources, for such taking is not characteristic of the man who sets no store by wealth, nor will he be a ready asker. For it is not characteristic of a man who confers benefits to accept them lightly. But he will take from the right sources, for example, from his own possessions, not as something noble, but as a necessity, that he may have something to give. Nor will he neglect his own property, since he wishes by means of this to help others. And he will refrain from giving to anybody and everybody, that he may have something to give to the right people at the right time and where it is noble to do so. It is highly characteristic of a liberal man also to go to excess in giving, so that he leaves too little for himself, for it is the nature of a liberal man not to look to himself. The term liberality is used relatively to a man's substance, for liberality resides not in the multitude of the gifts, but in the state of character of the giver, and this is relative to the giver's substance. There is therefore nothing to prevent the man who gives less from being the more liberal man, if he has less to give, those are thought to be more liberal who have not made their wealth, but inherited it. For in the first place, they have no experience of want. And secondly, all men are fonder of their own productions, as are parents and poets. It is not easy for the liberal man to be rich, since he is not apt either at taking or at keeping, but at giving away, and does not value wealth for its own sake, but as a means of giving. Hence comes the charge that is brought against fortune, that those who deserve riches most get it least. But it is not unreasonable that it should turn out so, for he cannot have wealth any more than anything else if he does not take pains to have it. Yet he will not give to the wrong people, nor at the wrong time, and so on. For he would no longer be acting in accordance with liberality. And if he spent on these objects, he would have nothing to spend on the right objects. For, as has been said, he is liberal who spends according to his substance and on the right objects, and he who exceeds is prodigal. Hence we do not call despots prodigal, for it is thought not easy for them to give and spend beyond the amount of their possessions. Liberality, then, being a mean with regard to giving and taking of wealth, the liberal man will both give and spend the right amounts and on the right objects, alike in small things and in great, and that with pleasure. He will also take the right amounts and from the right sources. For the virtue being a mean with regard to both, he will do both as he ought. Since this sort of taking accompanies proper giving, and that which is not of this sort is contrary to it, and accordingly the giving and taking that accompany each other are present together in the same man, while the contrary kinds evidently are not. But if he happens to spend in a manner contrary to what is right and noble, he will be pained, but moderately and as he ought. For it is the mark of virtue both to be pleased and to be pained at the right objects and in the right way. Further, the liberal man is easy to deal with in money matters, for he can be got the better of, since he sets no store by money, and is more annoyed if he has not spent something that he ought than pained if he has spent something that he ought not. 
and does not agree with the saying of Simonides. The prodigal errs in these respects also, for he is neither pleased nor pained at the right things or in the right way. This will be more evident as we go on. We have said that prodigality and meanness are excesses and deficiencies, and in two things, in giving and in taking, for we include spending under giving. Now, prodigality exceeds in giving and not taking, while meanness falls short in giving and exceeds in taking, except in small things. The characteristics of prodigality are not often combined, for it is not easy to give to all if you take from none. Private persons soon exhaust their substance with giving, and it is to these that the name of prodigals is applied. Though a man of this sort would seem to be in no small degree better than a mean man, for he is easily cured both by age and by poverty, and thus he may move towards the middle state. For he has the characteristics of the liberal man, since he both gives and refrains from taking, though he does neither of these in the right manner or well. Therefore, if he were brought to do so by habituation, or in some other way, he would be liberal. For he will then give to the right people and will not take from the wrong sources. This is why he is thought to have not a bad character. It is not the mark of a wicked or ennoble man to go to excess in giving and in not taking, but only of a foolish one. The man who is prodigal in this way is thought much better than the mean man, both for the aforesaid reasons and because he benefits many, while the other benefits no one, not even himself. But most prodigal people, as has been said, also take from the wrong sources and are in this respect mean. They become apt to take because they wish to spend and cannot do this easily, for their possessions soon run short. Thus they are forced to provide means from some other source. At the same time, because they care nothing for honor, they take recklessly and from any source, for they have an appetite for giving, and they do not mind how or from what source. Hence also their giving is not liberal, for it is not noble, nor does it aim at nobility, nor is it done in the right way. Sometimes they make rich those who should be poor, and will give nothing to people of respectable character, and much to flatterers are those who provide them with some other pleasure. Hence also most of them are self-indulgent, for they spend lightly and waste money on their indulgences, and incline towards pleasures, because they do not live with a view to what is noble. The prodigal man, then, turns into what we have described if he is left untutored. But if he is treated with care, he will arrive at the intermediate and right state. But meanness is both un incurable, for old age and every disability is thought to make men mean, and more innate in men than prodigality. For most men are fonder of getting money than of giving. It also extends widely and is multiform, since there seem to be many kinds of meanness. For it consists in two things, deficiency in giving and excess in taking and is not found complete in all men, but is sometimes divided. Some men go to excess in taking, others fall short in giving. Those who are called by such names are miserly, close, stingy, all fall short in giving, but do not covet the possessions of others, nor wish to get them. In some, this is due to a sort of honesty and avoidance of what is disgraceful, for some seem, or at least profess, to hoard their money for this reason, that they may not someday be forced to do something disgraceful. To this class belong the cheese parer and every one of the sort. He is so called from his excess of unwillingness to give anything. While others, again, keep their hands off the property of others from fear, on the ground that it is not easy, if one takes the property of others oneself, to avoid having one's own taken by them. They are therefore content neither to take nor to give. Others, again, exceed in respect of taking, by taking anything and from any source. For example, those who ply sordid trades, pimps, and all such people, and those who lend small sums and at high rates. For all of these take more than they ought and from wrong sources. What is common to them is evidently sordid love of gain. They all put up with a bad name for the sake of gain and little gain at that. For those who make great gains, but from wrong sources and not the right gains. For example, despots when they sack cities and spoil temples. We do not call mean, but rather wicked, impious, and unjust. But the gamester and the footpad and the highwayman belong to the class of the mean, since they have a sordid love of gain. For it is for gain that both of them ply their craft and endure the disgrace of it. And the one faces the greatest dangers for the sake of the booty, while the other makes gain from his friends to whom he ought to be giving. 
Both, then, since they are willing to make gain from wrong sources, are sordid lovers of gain. Therefore, all such forms of taking are mean. And it is natural that meanness is described as the contrary of liberality. For not only is it a greater evil than prodigality, but men err more often in this direction than in the way of prodigality, as we have described it. So much, then, for liberality and the opposed vices. Section 2. It would seem proper to discuss magnificence next, for this also seems to be a virtue concerned with wealth. But it does not, like liberality, extend to all the actions that are concerned with wealth, but only to those that involve expenditure. And in these, it surpasses liberality in scale. For, as the name itself suggests, it is a fitting expenditure involving largeness of scale. But the scale is relative, for the expense of equipping a trireme is not the same as that of heading a sacred embassy. It is what is fitting, then, in relation to the agent and to the circumstances and the object. The man who in small or middling things spends according to the merits of the case is not called magnificent. For example, the man who can say, many a gift I gave the wanderer, but only the man who does so in great things. For the magnificent man is liberal, but the liberal man is not necessarily magnificent. The deficiency of this state of character is called niggardliness, the excess vulgarity, lack of taste, and the like, which do not go to excess in the amount spent on right objects, but by showy expenditure in the wrong circumstances and the wrong matter. We shall speak of these vices later. The magnificent man is like an artist, for he can see what is fitting and spend large sums tastefully. For as we said at the beginning, state of character is determined by its activities and by its objects. Now the expenses of the magnificent man are large and fitting. Such, therefore, are also his results. For thus, there will be a great expenditure and one that is fitting to its result. Therefore, the result should be worthy of the expense, and the expense should be worthy of the result, or should even exceed it. And the magnificent man will spend such sums for honor's sake, for this is common to the virtues. And further, he will do so gladly and lavishly, for nice calculation is a niggardly thing. And he will consider how the result can be made most beautiful and most becoming, rather than for how much it can be produced and how it can be produced most cheaply. It is necessary, then, that the magnificent man be also liberal. For the liberal man also will spend what he ought and as he ought. And it is in these matters that the greatness implied in the name of the magnificent man, his bigness, as it were, is manifested, since liberality is concerned with these matters. And at an equal expense, he will produce a more magnificent work of art. For a possession and a work of art have not the same excellence. The most valuable possession is that which is worth most, for example, gold. But the most valuable work of art is that which is great and beautiful. For the contemplation of such a work inspires admiration, and so does magnificence. And a work has an excellence vis-a-vis -vis magnificence, which involves magnitude. Magnificence is an attribute of expenditures of the kind which we call honorable. For example, those connected with the gods, votive offerings, buildings, and sacrifices and similarly with any form of religious worship, and all those that are proper objects of public-spirited ambition, as when people think they ought to equip a chorus or a trireme, or entertain the city in a brilliant way. But in all cases, as has been said, we have regard to the agent as well, and ask who he is and what means he has. For the expenditure should be worthy of his means, and suit not only the result, but also the producer. Hence, a poor man cannot be magnificent, since he has not the means with which to spend large sums fittingly. And he who tries is a fool, since he spends beyond what can be expected of him and what is proper. But it is right expenditure that is virtuous. But great expenditure is becoming, to those who have suitable means to start with, acquired by their own efforts or from ancestors or connections, and to people of high birth or reputation, and so on. For all these things bring with them greatness and prestige. Primarily, then, the magnificent man is of this sort, and magnificence is shown in expenditures of this sort, as has been said. For these are the greatest and most honorable. Of private occasions of expenditure, the most suitable are those that take place once for all. For example, a wedding or anything of the kind, or anything that interests the whole city or the people of position in it. 
and also the receiving of foreign guests and the sending of them on their way, and gifts and counter-gifts, for the magnificent man spends not on himself but on public objects, and gifts bear some resemblance to votive offerings. A magnificent man will also furnish his house suitably to his wealth, for even a house is a sort of public ornament, and will spend by preference on those works that are lasting, for these are the most beautiful, and on every class of things he will spend what is becoming. For the same things are not suitable for gods and for men, nor in a temple and in a tomb. And since each expenditure may be great of its kind, and what is most magnificent absolutely is great expenditure on a great object, but what is magnificent here is what is great in these circumstances, and greatness in the work differs from greatness in the expense. For the most beautiful ball or bottle is magnificent as a gift to a child, but the price of it is small and mean. Therefore, it is characteristic of the magnificent man, whatever kind of result he is producing, to produce it magnificently, for such a result is not easily surpassed, and to make it worthy of the expenditure. Such, then, is the magnificent man, the man who goes to excess and is vulgar exceeds, as has been said, by spending beyond what is right. For on small objects of expenditure, he spends much and displays a tasteless showiness. For example, he gives a club dinner on the scale of a wedding banquet, and when he provides the chorus for a comedy, he brings them onto stage in purple, as they do at Megara. And all such things he will do, not for honor's sake, but to show off his wealth and because he thinks he is admired for these things, and where he ought to spend much, he spends little and where little, much. The niggardly man, on the other hand, will fall short in everything, and after spending the greatest sums will spoil the beauty of the result for a trifle. And whatever he is doing, he will hesitate and consider he, how he may spend least, and lament even that, and think he is doing everything on a bigger scale than he ought. These states of character, then, are vices, yet they do not bring disgrace because they are neither harmful to one's neighbor nor very unseemly. Section 3. Pride seems, even from its name, to be concerned with great things. What sort of great things is the first question we must try to answer. It makes no difference whether we consider the state of character or the man characterized by it. Now the man is thought to be proud who thinks himself worthy of great things, being worthy of them. For he who does so beyond his deserts is a fool, but no virtuous man is foolish or silly. The proud man, then, is the man we have described. For he who is worthy of little and thinks himself worthy of little is temperate, but not proud. For pride implies greatness, as beauty implies a good-sized body, and little people may be neat and well-proportioned, but cannot be beautiful. On the other hand, he who thinks himself worthy of great things, being unworthy of them, is vain. Though not everyone who thinks himself worthy of more than he really is worthy of in vain. The man who thinks himself worthy of less than he is really worthy of is unduly humble, whether his deserts be great or moderate, or his deserts be small, but his claims yet smaller. And the man whose deserts are great would seem most unduly humble, for what would he have done if they had been less? The proud man, then, is an extreme in respect of the greatness of his claims, but a mean in respect of the rightness of them. For he claims what is in accordance with his merits, while the others go to excess or fall short. If, then, he deserves and claims great things, and above all the great things, he will be concerned with one thing in particular. Desert is relative to external goods, and the greatest of these, we should say, is that which we render to the gods, and which people of position most aim at, and which is the prize appointed for the noblest deeds. And this is honor. That is surely the greatest of external goods. Honors and dishonors, therefore, are the objects with respect to which the proud man is as he should be. And even apart from argument, it is with honor that proud men appear to be concerned. For it is honor that they chiefly claim, but in accordance with their deserts. The unduly humble man falls short both in comparison with his own merits and in comparison with the proud man's claims. The vain man goes to excess in comparison with his own merits, but does not exceed the proud man's claims. Now the proud man, since he deserves most, must be good in the highest degree. For the better man always deserves more, and the best man most. Therefore, the truly proud man must be good. And greatness in every virtue would seem to be characteristic of a proud man. And it would be most unbecoming for a proud man to fly from danger, swinging his arms by his sides, or to wrong another. 
For to what end should he do disgraceful acts, he to whom nothing is great? If we consider him point by point, we shall see the utter absurdity of a proud man who is not good. Nor again would he be worthy of honor if he were bad. For honor is the prize of virtue, and it is to the good that it is rendered. Pride, then, seems to be a sort of crown of the virtues, for it makes them greater, and it is not found without them. Therefore it is hard to be truly proud, for it is impossible without nobility and goodness of character. It is chiefly with honors and dishonors, then, that the proud man is concerned, and honors that are great and conferred by good men he will be moderately pleased, thinking that he is coming by his own or even less than his own. For there can be no honor that is worthy of perfect virtue. Yet he will at any rate accept it, since they have nothing greater to bestow on him. But honor from casual people and on trifling grounds he will utterly despise, since it is not this that he deserves, and dishonor too, since in his case it cannot be just. In the first place, then, as has been said, the proud man is concerned with honors. Yet he will also bear himself with moderation towards wealth and power and all good or evil fortune. Whatever may befall him, and will be neither overjoyed by good fortune nor overpained by evil. For not even towards honor does he bear himself as if it were a very great thing. Power and wealth are desirable for the sake of honor. At least those who have them wish to get honor by means of them. And for him, to whom even honor is a little thing, the others must be so too. Hence proud men are thought to be disdainful. The goods of fortune also are thought to contribute towards pride. For men who are well-born are thought worthy of honor, and so are those who enjoy power or wealth, for they are in a superior position, and everything that has a superiority in something good is held in greater honor. Hence, even such things make men prouder, for they are honored by some for having them. But in truth, the good man alone is to be honored. He, however, who has both advantages is thought the more worthy of honor. But those who, without virtue, have such goods are neither justified in making great claims nor entitled to the name of proud, for these things imply perfect virtue. Disdainful and insolent, however, even those who have such goods become. For without virtue it is not easy to bear gracefully the goods of fortune, and, being unable to bear them, and thinking themselves superior to others, they despise others and themselves do what they please. They imitate the proud man without being like him, and this they do where they can. So they do not act virtuously, but they do despise others. For the proud man despises justly, since he thinks truly, but the many do so at random. He does not run into trifling dangers, nor is he fond of danger, because he honors few things. But he will face great dangers, and when he is in danger, he is unsparing of life knowing that there are conditions on which life is not worth having. And he is the sort of man to confer benefits, but he is ashamed of receiving them. For the one is the mark of a superior, the other of an inferior. And he is apt to confer greater benefits in return. For thus the original benefactor, besides being paid, will incur a debt to him, and will be the gainer by transaction. They seem also to remember any service they have done, but not those they have received. For he who receives a service is inferior to him who has done it, but the proud man wishes to be superior, and to hear of the former with pleasure, of the latter with displeasure. This, it seems, is why Thetis did not mention to Zeus the services she had done him, and why the Spartans did not recount their services to the Athenians, but those that they had received. It is a mark of the proud man also to ask for nothing or scarcely anything, but to give help readily and to be dignified towards people who enjoy high position and good fortune, but unassuming towards those of the middle class. For it is a difficult and lofty thing to be superior to the former, but easy to be so to the latter, and a lofty bearing over the former is no mark of ill breeding, but among humble people it is as vulgar as a display of strength against the weak. Again, it is characteristic of the proud man not to aim at the things commonly held in honor, or the things in which others excel. To be sluggish and to hold back except where great honor or a great work is at stake, and to be a man of few deeds, but of great and notable ones. He must also be open in his hate and his love. 
For to conceal one's feelings, in other words, to care less for truth than for what people will think, is a coward's part. And must speak and act openly. For he is free of speech because he is contemptuous, and he is given to telling the truth, except when he speaks in irony to the vulgar. He must be unable to make his life revolved around another, unless it be a friend, for this is slavish. And for this reason all flatterers are servile, and people laughing in self-respect are flatterers. Nor is he given to admiration, for nothing to him is great. Nor is he mindful of wrongs, for it is not the part of a proud man to have a long memory, especially for wrongs, but rather to overlook them. Nor is he a gossip, for he will speak neither about himself nor about another, since he cares not to be praised nor for others to be blamed. Nor again is he given to praise. And for the same reason he is not an evil speaker, even about his enemies, except from haughtiness. With regard to necessary or small matters, he is at least of all given to lamentation or the asking of favors. For it is the part of one who takes such matters seriously to behave so with respect to them. He is one who will possess beautiful and profitless things rather than profitable and useful ones. For this is more proper to a character that suffices to itself. Further, a slow step is thought proper to the proud man, a deep voice and level utterance. For the man who takes few things seriously is not likely to be hurried, nor the man who thinks nothing great to be excited, while a shrill voice and a rapid gait are the results of hurry and excitement. Such then is the proud man. The man who falls short of him is unduly humble, and the man who goes beyond him is vain. Now even these are not thought to be bad, for they are not malicious, but only mistaken. For the unduly humble man, being worthy of good things, robs himself of what he deserves. And to have something bad about him from the fact that he does not think himself worthy of good things and seems also not to know himself, else he would have desired the things he was worthy of since these were good. Yet such people are not thought to be fools, but rather unduly retiring. Such a reputation, however, seems actually to make them worse, for each class of people aims at what corresponds to its worth, and these people stand back even from noble undertakings and actions deeming themselves unworthy, and from external goods no less. Vain people, on the other hand, are fools and ignorant of themselves, and that manifestly. For not being worthy of them, they attempt honorable undertakings, and, they are, and then are found out, and they adorn themselves with clothing and outward show and such things, and wish their strokes of good fortune to be made public, and speak about them as if they would be honored for them. But undue humility is more opposed to pride than vanity is, for it is both commoner and worse. Pride, then, is concerned with honor on the grand scale, as has been said. Section 4. There seems to be in the sphere of honor also, as was said in our first remarks on the subject, a virtue which would appear to be related to pride as liberality is to magnificence. For neither of these has anything to do with the grand scale, but both dispose us as is right to with regard to middling and unimportant objects. As in getting and giving of wealth there is a mean and an excess and defect, so too honor may be desired more than is right, or less, or from the right sources and in the right way. We blame both the ambitious man as at honor more than is right and from wrong sources, and the unambitious man as not willing to be honored even for noble reasons. But sometimes we praise the ambitious man as being manly and a lover of what is noble, and the unambitious man as being moderate and self-controlled, as we said in our first treatment of the subject. Evidently, since fond of such and such an object has more than one meaning, we do not assign the term ambition or love of honor always to the same thing. But when we praise the quality, we think of the man who loves honor more than most people. And when we blame it, we think of him who loves it more than is right. The mean being without a name, the extremes seem to dispute for its place as though that were vacant by default. But where there is excess and defect, there is also an intermediate. Now men desire honor both more than they should and less. Therefore, it is possible also to do so as one should. At all events, this is the state of character that is praised, being an unnamed mean in respect of honor. Relatively to ambition, it seems to be unambitiousness, and relatively to unambitiousness, it seems to be ambition, while relatively to both, severally, it seems, in a sense, to be both together. This appears to be true of the other virtues also, but in this case, the extremes seem to be contradictories because the mean has not received a name. 
Section five. Good temper is a mean with respect to anger, the middle state being unnamed and the extremes also without a name as well. We place good temper in the middle position, though it inclines towards the deficiency, which is without a name. The excess might be called a sort of irascibility, for the passion is anger, while its causes are many and diverse. The man who is angry at the right things and with the right people, and further, as he ought, when he ought, and as long as he ought, is praised. This will be the good-tempered man, then, since good temper is praised. For the good-tempered man tends to be unperturbed and not to be led by passion, but to be angry in the manner at the things and for the length of time that the rule dictates. But he is thought to err rather in the direction of deficiency. For the good-tempered man is not revengeful, but rather tends to make allowances. The deficiency, whether it is a sort of inerascibility or whatever it is, is blamed. For those who are not angry at the things they should be angry at are thought to be fools. And so are those who are not angry in the right way at the right time or with the right persons. For such a man is thought not to feel things, nor to be pained by them, and since he does not get angry, he is thought unlikely to defend himself. And to endure being insulted and put up with insult to one's friends is slavish. The excess can be manifested in all the points that have been named, for one can be angry with the wrong persons at the wrong times more than is right too quickly or too long. Yet all are not found in the same person. Indeed, they could not, for evil destroys even itself, and it is, if it is complete, becomes unbearable. Now hot-tempered people get angry quickly and with the wrong persons and at the wrong things and more than is right. But their anger ceases quickly which is the best point about them. This happens to them because they do not restrain their anger, but retaliate openly owing to their quickness of temper, and then their anger ceases. By reason of excess, choleric people are quick-tempered and ready to be angry with everything and on every occasion. Whence their name? Sulky people are hard to appease and retain their anger long, for they repress their passion. But it ceases when they retaliate, for revenge relieves them of their anger producing in them pleasure instead of pain. If this does not happen, they retain their burden, for owing to it not being obvious, no one even reasons with them, and to digest one's anger in oneself takes time. Such people are most troublesome to themselves and to their dearest friends. We call hot-tempered those who are angry at the wrong things more than is right, and longer, and cannot be appeased until they inflict vengeance or punishment. To good temper we oppose the excess rather than the defect, for not only is it commoner since revenge is the more human, but bad-tempered people are worse to live with. What we have said in our earlier treatment of the subject is plain also from what we are now saying, vis-a-vis -vis that it is not easy to define how, with whom, at what, and how long one should be angry, and at what point right action ceases and wrong begins. For the man who strays a little from the path, either towards the more or towards the less, is not blamed. Since sometimes we praise those who exhibit the deficiency and call them good-tempered, and sometimes we call angry people manly as being capable of ruling. How far, therefore, and how a man must stray before he becomes blameworthy is not easy to state in words, for the decision depends on the particular facts and on perceptions. But so much at least is plain, that the middle state is praiseworthy that in virtue of which we are angry with the right people, at the right things, in the right way, and so on, while the excesses and defects are blameworthy, slightly so if they are present in a low degree, more if in a higher degree, and very much if in a high degree. Evidently, then, we must cling to the middle state. Enough of the states relative to anger. Section 6. In gatherings of men, in social life, and in the interchange of words and deeds, some men are thought to be obsequious, vis-a-vis -vis those who, to give pr pleasure, praise everything and never oppose, but think it their duty to give no pain to the people they meet. While those who, on the contrary, oppose everything and care not a whit about giving pain are called churlish and contentious. That the states we have named are culpable is plain enough, and that the middle state is laudable, that in virtue of which a man will put up with and will resent the right things and in the right way. But no name has been assigned to it, though it most resembles friendship. For the man who corresponds to this middle state is very much, with affection added, we call a good friend. But the state in question differs from friendship in that it implies no passion or affection for one's associates, 
since it is not by reason of loving or hating that such a man takes everything in the right way, but by being a man of a certain kind. For he will behave so alike towards those he knows and those he does not know, towards intimates and those who are not so. Except that in each of these cases he will behave as is befitting. For it is not proper to have the same care for intimates and for strangers, nor again is it the same conditions that make it right to give pain to them. Now we have said generally that he will associate with people in the right way. But it is by reference to what is honorable and expedient that he will aim at not giving pain or at contributing pleasure. For he seems to be concerned with the pleasures and pains of social life. And wherever it is not honorable or is harmful for him to contribute pleasure, he will refuse, and will choose rather to give pain. Also, if his acquiescence in another's action will bring disgrace, and that in a high degree, or injury, on that other, while his opposition brings a little pain, he will not acquiesce, but will decline. He will associate differently with people in high station, and with ordinary people, with closer and more distant acquaintances, and so too with regard to all other differences, rendering to each class what is befitting, and while for its own sake he chooses to contribute pleasure, and avoids the giving of pain. He will be guided by the consequences, if these are greater, in other words, honor and expediency. For the sake of a great future pleasure, too, he will inflict small pains. The man who attains the mean, then, is such as we have described, but has not received a name, of those who contribute pleasure. The man who aims at being pleasant with no ulterior object is obsequious. But the man who does so in order that he may get some advantage in the direction of money or the things that money buys is a flatterer. While the man who quarrels with everything is, as has been said, churlish and contentious. And the extremes seem to be contradictory to each other because the mean is without a name. Section 7. The mean, opposed to boastfulness, is found in almost the same sphere. And this is also without a name. It will be no bad plan to describe these states as well, for we shall both know the facts about character better if we go through them in detail. We shall be convinced that the virtues are means if we see this to be so in all cases. In the field of social life, those who make the giving of pleasure or pain their object in associating with others have been described. Let us now describe those who pursue truth or falsehood alike in words and deeds and in the claims they put forward. The boastful man, then, is thought to be apt to claim the things that bring glory, when he has not got them, or to claim more of them than he has and the mock-modest man, on the other hand, to disclaim what he has or belittle it. While the man who observes the mean is one who calls a thing by its own name, being truthful both in life and in word, owning to what he has, and neither more nor less. Now each of these courses may be adopted either with or without an object, but each man speaks and acts and lives in accordance with his character, if he is not acting for some ulterior object. And falsehood is in itself mean and culpable, and truth noble and worthy of praise. Thus the truthful man is another case of a man who, being in the mean, is worthy of praise. And both forms of untruthful man are culpable, and particularly the boastful man. Let us discuss them both, but first of all the truthful man. We are not speaking of the man who keeps faith in his agreements, in other words, in the things that pertain to justice or injustice, for this would belong to another virtue. But the man who in the matters in which nothing of this sort is at stake is true both in word and in life because his character is such. But such a man would seem to be, as a matter of fact, equitable. For the man who loves truth and is truthful where nothing is at stake will still be more truthful where something is at stake. He will avoid falsehood as something base, seeing that he avoided it even for its own sake. And such a man is worthy of praise. He inclines rather to understate the truth for this seems in better taste because exaggerations are wearisome. He who claims more than he has with no ulterior object is cont a contemptible sort of fellow. Otherwise, he would not have delighted in falsehood, but seems futile rather than bad. But if he does it for an object, he who does it for the sake of reputation or honor is, for a boaster, not very much to be blamed. But he who does it for money, or the things that lead to money, is an uglier character. It is not the capacity that makes the boaster, but the purpose, for it is in virtue of his state of character, and by being a man of a certain kind that he is a boaster. 
as one man is a liar because he enjoys the lie itself, and another because he desires reputation or gain. Now those who boast for the sake of reputation claim such qualities as will praise or congratulations. But those whose object is gain claim qualities which are of value to one's neighbors, and one's lack of which is not easily detected. For example, the powers of a seer, a sage, or a physician. For this reason, it is such things as these that most people claim and boast about. For in them, the above-mentioned qualities are found. Mock modest people who understate things seem more attractive in character, for they are thought to speak not for gain, but to avoid parade. And here, too, it is qualities which bring reputation that they disclaim, as Socrates used to do. Those who disclaim trifling and obvious qualities are called humbugs and are more contemptible. And sometimes this seems to be boastfulness, like the Spartan dress, for both excess and great deficiency are boastful. But those who use understatement with moderation and understate about matters that do not very much force themselves on our notice seem attractive. And it is the boaster that seems to be opposed to the truthful man, for he is the worst character. Section 8. Since life includes rest as well as activity, and in this is included leisure and amusement, there seems here also to be a kind of intercourse which is tasteful. There is such a thing as saying, and again listening to, what one should and as one should. The kind of people one is speaking or listening to will also make a difference. Evidently here also there is both an excess and def deficiency as compared with the mean. Those who carry humor to excess are thought to be vulgar buffoons, striving after humor at all costs, and aiming rather at raising a laugh than at saying what is becoming and at avoiding pain to the object of their fun. While those who can neither make a joke themselves nor put up with those who do are thought to be boorish and unpolished. But those who joke in a tasteful way are called ready-witted, which implies a sort of readiness to turn this way and that, for such sallies are thought to be movements of the character. And as bodies are discriminated by their movements, so too are characters. The ridiculous side of things is not far to seek, however, and most people delight more than they should in amusement and in jestingly. And so even buffoons are called ready-witted because they are found attractive. But that they differ from the ready-witted men, and to no small extent, is clear from what has been said. To the middle state belongs also tact. It is the mark of a tactful man to say and listen to such things as befit a good and well-bred man. For there are some things that it befits such a man to say and to hear by way of jest. And the well-bred man's jesting differs from that of a vulgar man, and the joking of an educated man from that of an uneducated. One may see this even from the old and the new comedies. To the authors of the former, indecency of language was amusing. To those of the latter, innuendo is more so. And these differ in no small degree in respect of propriety. Now, should we define the man who jokes well by his saying what is not unbecoming to a well-bred man, or by his not giving pain, or even giving delight to the hearer? Or is the latter definition, at any rate, itself indefinite, since different things are hateful or pleasant to different people? The kind of jokes he will listen to will be the same, for the kind he can put up with are also the kind he seems to make. There are, then, jokes he will not make, for the jest is a sort of abuse, and there are things that lawgivers forbid us to abuse, and they should, perhaps, have forbidden us even to make a jest of such. The refined and well-bred man, therefore, will be as we have described, being as it were a law to himself. Such, then, is the man who observes the mean, whether he be called tactful or ready-witted. The buffoon, on the other hand, is the slave of his sense of humor, and spares neither himself nor others, if he can raise a laugh, and says things none of which a man of refinement would say, and to some of which he would not even listen. The boor, again, is useless for such social intercourse, for he contributes nothing and finds fault with everything. But relaxation and amusement are thought to be a necessary element in life. The means in life that have been described, then, are three in number, and are all concerned with an interchange of words and deeds of some kind. They differ, however, in that one is concerned with truth and the other two with pleasantness. Of those concerned with pleasure, one is displayed in jests, the other in the general social intercourse of life. Section 9. Shame should not be described as a virtue, for it is more like a feeling than a state of character. It is defined, at any rate, as a kind of fear of dishonor, 
and produces an effect similar to that produced by fear of danger. For people who feel disgraced blush, and those who fear death turn pale. Both, therefore, seem to be, in a sense, bodily conditions, which is thought to be characteristic of feeling rather than of a state of character. The feeling is not becoming to every age, but only to youth. For we think young people should be prone to the feelings of shame because they live by feeling and therefore commit many errors, but are restrained by shame. And we praise young people who are prone to this feeling, but an older person no one would praise for being prone to the sense of disgrace, since we think he should not do anything that need cause this sense. For the sense of disgrace is not even characteristic of a good man, since it is consequent on bad actions. For such actions should not be done. And if some actions are disgraceful in very truth, and others only according to common opinion, this makes no difference. For neither class of actions should be done, so that no disgrace should be felt. And it is a mark of a bad man even to be such as to do any disgraceful action. To be so constituted as to feel disgraced if one does such an action, and for this feeling to think oneself good is absurd. For it is for voluntary actions that shame is felt, and the good man will never voluntarily do bad actions. But shame may be said to be conditionally a good thing. If a good man does such actions, he will feel disgraced. But the virtues are not subject to such a qualification. And if shamelessness, not to be ashamed of doing base actions, is bad, that does not make it good to be ashamed of doing such actions. Continence, too, is not a virtue, but a mixed sort of state. This will be shown later. Now, however, let us discuss justice. Book 5, Section 1. With regards to justice and injustice, we must, one, consider what kind of actions they are concerned with, two, what sort of mean justice is, and three, between what extremes the just act is intermediate. Our investigation shall follow the same course as the preceding discussions. We see that all men mean by justice that kind of state of character which makes people disposed to do what is just and makes them act justly and wish for what is just. And similarly, by injustice, that state which makes them act unjustly and wish for what is unjust. Let us, too, then, lay this down as a general basis. For the same is not true of the sciences and of the faculties as of states of character. A faculty, or a science which is one and the same, is held to relate to contrary objects. But a state of character, which is one of two contraries, does not produce the contrary results. For example, as a result of health, we do not do what is the opposite of healthy, but only what is healthy. For we say a man walks healthily when he walks as a healthy man would. Now often one contrary state is recognized from its contrary and often states are recognized from the subjects that exhibit them. For A, if good condition is known, bad condition also becomes known, and B, good condition is known from the things that are in good condition, and they from it. If good condition is firmness of flesh, it is necessary both that the bad condition should be flabbiness of flesh, and that the wholesome should be that which causes firmness in flesh. And it follows for the most part that if one contrary is ambiguous, the other also will be ambiguous. For example, if just is so, then unjust will be so too. Now justice and injustice seem to be ambiguous, but because their different meanings approach near to one another, the ambiguity escapes notice and is not obvious as it is, comparatively, when the meanings are far apart. For example, for here the difference in outward form is great, as the ambiguity in the use of clies for the collarbone of an animal, and for that with which we lock a door. Let us take as a starting point, then, the various meanings of an unjust man. Both the lawless man and the grasping and unfair man are thought to be unjust, so that evidently both the law-abiding and the fair man will be just. The just, then, is the lawful and the fair, the unjust, the unlawful, and the unfair. Since the unjust man is grasping, he must be concerned with goods, not all goods, but those with which prosperity and adversity have to do, 
which taken absolutely are always good, but for a particular person are not always good. Now, men pray for and pursue these things, but they should not, but should pray that the things that are good absolutely may also be good for them, and should choose the things that are good for them. The unjust man does not always choose the greater, but also the less, in the case of things bad absolutely. But because the lesser evil is itself thought to be, in a sense, good, and graspingness is directed at the good, therefore he is thought to be grasping, and he is unfair, for this contains and is common to both. Since the lawless man was seen to be unjust, and the law-abiding man just, evidently all lawful acts are, in a sense, just acts. For the acts laid down by the legislative art are lawful, and each of these, we say, is just. Now the laws in their enactments on all subjects aim at the common advantage either of all or of the best or of those who hold power, or something of the sort, so that in one sense we call those acts just, those that tend to produce and preserve happiness and its components for the political society. And the law bids us to do both the acts of a brave man, for example, not to desert our post, nor to take flight, nor throw away our arms and those of a temperate man, for example, not to commit adultery, nor to gratify one's lust, and those of a good-tempered man, for example, not to strike another, nor to speak evil. And similarly, with regard to the other virtues and forms of wickedness, commanding some acts and forbidding others, and the rightly framed law does this rightly, and the hastily conceived one less well. This form of justice, then, is complete virtue, but not absolutely, but in relation to our neighbor. And therefore, justice is often thought to be the greatest of virtues. And neither evening nor morning star is so wonderful, and proverbially, injustice is every virtue comprehended. And it is complete virtue in its fullest sense, because it is the actual exercise of complete virtue. It is complete because he who possesses it can exercise his virtue, not only in himself, but towards his neighbor also. For many men can exercise virtue in their own affairs, but not in their relations to their neighbor. This is why the saying of bias is thought to be true, that rule will show the man. For a ruler is necessarily in relation to other men and a member of society. For this same reason, justice, alone of the virtues, is thought to be another's good, because it is related to our neighbor. For it does what is advantageous to another, either a ruler or a co-partner. Now the worst man is he who exercises his wickedness, both towards himself and towards his friends. And the best man is not he who exercises his virtue towards himself, but he who exercises it toward another. For this is a difficult task. Justice, in this sense, then, is not part of virtue, but virtue entire. Nor is the contrary injustice a part of vice, but vice entire. What the difference is between virtue and justice, in this sense, is plain from what we have said. They are the same, but their essence is not the same. What, as a relation to one's neighbor is justice is, as a certain kind of state without qualification, virtue. Section 2. But at all events, what we are investigating is the justice which is a part of virtue. For there is a justice of this kind, as we maintain. Similarly, it is with injustice in the particular sense that we are concerned. That there is such a thing is indicated by the fact that while the man who exhibits inaction the other forms of wickedness acts wrongly indeed, but not graspingly. For example, the man who throws away his shield through cowardice, or speaks harshly through bad temper, or fails to help a friend with money through meanness. When a man acts graspingly, he often exhibits none of these vices. No, nor altogether, but certainly wickedness of some kind, for we blame him, and injustice. There is, then, another kind of injustice, which is a part of injustice in the wide sense and a use of the word unjust, which answers to a part of what is unjust in the wide sense of contrary to the law. Again, if one man commits adultery for the sake of gain and makes money by it, while another does so at the bidding of appetite, though he loses money and is penalized for it, the latter would be held to be self-indulgent rather than grasping. But the former is unjust, but not self-indulgent. Evidently, therefore, he is unjust by reason of his making gain by his act. Again, all other unjust acts are ascribed invariably to some particular kind of wickedness. 
For example, adultery to self-indulgence, the desertion of a comrade in battle to cowardice, physical violence to anger. But if a man makes gain, his action is ascribed to no form of wickedness but unjustice. Evidently, therefore, there is, apart from injustice in the wide sense, another particular injustice, which shares the name and nature of the first, because its definition falls within the same genus. For the significance of both consists in relation to one's neighbor. But the one is concerned with honor or money or safety, or that which includes all these, if we had a single name for it. And its motive is the pleasure that arises from gain, while the other is concerned with all the objects with which the good man is concerned. It is clear, then, that there is more than one kind of justice, and that there is one which is distinct from virtue entire. We must try to grasp its genus and differentia. The unjust has been divided into the unlawful and the unfair, and the just into the lawful and the fair. To the unlawful answers the aforementioned sense of injustice. But since unfair and the unlawful are not the same, but are different as a part is from its whole, for all that is unfair is unlawful, but not all that is unlawful is unfair. The unjust and injustice in the sense of the unfair are not the same as, but different from the former kind, as part from whole. For injustice in this sense is a part of injustice in the wide sense. And similarly, justice in the one sense of justice in the other. Therefore, we must speak also about particular justice and particular and similarly about the just and the unjust. The justice, then, which answers to the whole of virtue, and the corresponding injustice, one being the exercise of virtue as a whole, and the other that of vice as a whole, towards one's neighbor, we may leave on one side. And how the meanings of just and unjust which answer to these are to be distinguished is evident. For practically the majority of the acts commanded by the law are those which are prescribed from the point of view of virtue taken as a whole. For the law bids us practice every virtue and forbids us to practice any vice. And the things that tend to produce virtue, taken as a whole, are those of the acts prescribed by the law, which have been prescribed with a view to education for the common good. But with regard to the education of the individual as such, which makes him without qualification a good man, we must determine later whether this is the same function of the political art or of another. For perhaps it is not the same to be a good man and a good citizen of any state taken at random. Of particular justice and that which is just in the corresponding sense, a. One kind is that which is manifested in distributions of honor or money or the things that fall to be divided among those who have a share in the Constitution. For in these it is possible for one man to have a share either unequal or equal to that of another. And b. One is that which plays a rectifying part in transactions between man and man. Of this, there are two divisions. Of transactions, one, some are voluntary, and two, others involuntary. Voluntary, such transactions as sale, purchase, loan for consumption, pledging, loan for use, depositing, letting, they are called voluntary because the origin of these transactions is voluntary. While of the involuntary, A, some are the clandestine, such as theft, adultery, poisoning, procuring, enticement of slaves, assassination, false witness, and b, others are violent, such as assault, imprisonment, murder, robbery with violence, mutilation, abuse, and insult. Section 3. A. We have shown that both the unjust man and the unjust act are unfair or unequal. Now, it is clear that there is also an intermediate between the two unequals involved in either case. And this is the equal. For in any kind of action in which there's a more and a less, there is also what is equal. If, then, the unjust is unequal, just is equal, as all men suppose it to be, even apart from argument. And since the equal is intermediate, the just will be an intermediate. Now, equality implies at least two things. The just, then, must be both intermediate and equal relative, in other words, for certain persons. And since the equal intermediate, it must be between certain things, which are respectively greater and less. Equal, it involves two things. Qua just, it is for certain people. The just, therefore, involves at least four terms. For the person for whom it is in fact just are two, and the things in which it is manifested, the objects distributed, are two. And the same equality will exist between the persons and between the things concerned. 
For as the latter, the things concerned, are related, so are the former, if they are not equal, they will not have what is equal. But this is the origin of quarrels and complaints. When either equals have and are awarded unequal shares, or unequals equal shares. Further, this is plain from the fact that awards should be according to merit. For all men agree that what is just in distribution must be according to merit in some sense, though they do not all specify the same sort of merit, but Democrats identify it with the status of freemen, supporters of oligarchy with wealth or with noble birth, and supporters of aristocracy with excellence. The just, then, is a species of the proportionate, proportion being not a property only of the kind of number, which consists of abstract units, but of number in general. For proportion is equality of ratios, and involves four terms at least. That discrete proportion involves four terms as plain, but so does continuous proportion, for it uses one term as two and mentions it twice. For example, as the line A is to the line B, so is the line B to the line C. The line B, then, has been mentioned twice, so that if the line B be assumed twice, the proportional terms will be four. And the just, too, involves at least four terms. And the ratio between one pair is the same as that between the other pair. For there is a similar distinction between the persons and between the things. As the term A, then, is to B, so will C be to D. And therefore, alternando is A to C. B will be to D. Therefore, also, the whole is in the same ratio to the whole. And this coupling the distribution effects, and if the terms are so combined, effects justly. The conjunction, then, of the term A with C and of B with D is what is just in distribution. And this species of the just is intermediate, and the unjust is what violates the proportion. For the proportional is intermediate, and the just is proportional. Mathematicians call this kind of proportion geometrical. For it is in geometrical proportion that it follows that the whole is to the whole as either part is to the corresponding part. This proportion is not continuous, for we cannot get a single term standing for a person and a thing. This, then, is what the just is, the proportional. The unjust is what violates the proportion. Hence, one term becomes too great, the other too small, as indeed happens in practice. For the man who acts unjustly has too much, and the man who is unjustly treated too little of what is good. In the case of evil, the reverse is true, for the lesser evil is reckoned a good in comparison with the greater evil, since the lesser evil is rather to be chosen than the greater, and what is worthy of choice is good, and what is worthier of choice a greater good. This, then, is one species of the just. Section 4. The remaining one is the rectificatory which arises in connection with transactions both voluntary and involuntary. This form of the just has a different specific character from the former. For the justice which distributes common possessions is always in accordance with the kind of proportion mentioned above. For in the case also in which the distribution is made from the common funds of a partnership, it will be according to the same ratio which the funds put into the business by the partners bear to one another. And the injustice opposed to this kind of justice is that which violates the proportion. But the justice in transactions between man and man is a sort of equality, indeed, and the injustice a sort of inequality. Not according to that kind of proportion, however, but according to arithmetical proportion. For it makes no difference whether a good man has defrauded a bad man or a bad man a good one. Nor whether it is a good or a bad man that has committed adultery. The law looks only to the distinctive character of the injury and treats the parties as equal, if one is in the wrong and the other is being wronged, and if one inflicted injury and the other has received it. Therefore, this kind of injustice being an inequality, the judge tries to equalize it. For in the case also in which one has received and the other has inflicted a wound, or one has slain and the other has been slain, the suffering and the action have been unequally distributed. But the judge tries to equalize by means of the penalty, taking away from the gain of the assailant. For the term gain is applied generally to such cases, even if it be not a term appropriate to certain cases, for example, to the person who inflicts a wound and loss to the sufferer. At all events, when the suffering has been estimated, the one is called loss and the other gain. Therefore, the equal is intermediate between the greater and the less but the gain and the loss are respectively greater and less in contrary ways. 
More of the good and less of the evil are gain, and the contrary is loss. Intermediate between them is, as we saw, equal, which we say is just. Therefore, corrective justice will be the intermediate between loss and gain. This is why, when people dispute, they take refuge in the judge, and to go to the judge is to go to justice. For the nature of the judge is to be a sort of animate justice, and they seek the judge as an intermediate, and in some states they call judges mediators, on the assumption that if they get what is intermediate, they will get what is just. The just, then, is an intermediate, since the judge is so. Now the judge restores equality. It is as though there were a line divided into unequal parts, and he took away that by which the greater segment exceeds the half, and added it to the smaller segment. And when the whole has been equally divided, then they say they have their own, in other words, when they have got what is equal. The equal is intermediate between the greater and the lesser line, according to the arithmetical proportion. It is for this reason also that it is called just, because it is a division into two equal parts, just as if one were to call it sekion, and the judge is the one who bisects. For when something is subtracted from one of the two equals and added to the other, the other is in excess by these two. Since if what was taken from the one had not been added to the other, the latter would have been in excess by one only. It therefore exceeds the intermediate by one, and the intermediate exceeds by one that from which something was taken. By this, then, we shall recognize both what we must subtract from that which has more, and what we must add to that which has less. We must add to the latter that by which the intermediate exceeds it, and subtract from the greatest that by which it exceeds the intermediate. Let the lines AA prime, BB prime, CC prime be equal to one another. From the line AA prime, let the segment AE have been subtracted, and to the line CC prime, let the segment CD have been added, so that the whole line DCC prime exceeds the line EA prime by the segment CD and the segment CF. Therefore, it exceeds the line BB prime by the segment CD. These names, both loss and gain, have come from voluntary exchange, for to have more than one's own is called gaining, and to have less than one's original share is called losing, for example, in buying and selling and in all other matters in which the law has left people free to make their own terms. But when they get neither more nor less, but just what belongs to themselves, they say that they have their own and that they neither lose nor gain. Therefore, the just is intermediate between a sort of gain and a sort of loss, vis-a-vis -vis those which are involuntary. It consists in having an equal amount before and after the transaction. Section 5. Some think that reciprocity is without qualification just, as the Pythagoreans said, for they defined justice without qualification as reciprocity. Now, reciprocity fits neither distributive nor rectificatory justice, yet people want even the justice of Radamanthus to mean this. Should a man suffer what he did, right justice would be done. For in many cases, reciprocity and rectificatory justice are not in accord. For example, one, if an official has inflicted a wound, he should not be wounded in return. And if someone has wounded an official, he ought not to be wounded only, but punished in addition. Further, too, there is a great difference between a voluntary and an involuntary act. But in associations for exchange, this sort of justice does hold men together. Reciprocity in accordance with the proportion, and not on the basis of precisely equal return. For it is by proportionate requital that the city holds together. Men seek to return either evil for evil, and if they cannot do so, think their position mere slavery, or good for good, and if they cannot do so, there is no exchange, but it is by exchange that they hold together. This is why they give a prominent place to the Temple of the Graces, to promote the requital of services, for this is characteristic of grace. We should serve in return one who has shown grace to us, and should another time take the initiative in showing it. Now, proportionate return is secured by cross-conjunction. Let A be a builder, B a shoemaker, C a house, D a shoe. The builder, then, must get from the shoemaker the latter's work, and must himself give him in return his own. If, then, first there is proportionate equality of goods, 
and then reciprocal action takes place, the result we mention will be effected. If not, the bargain is not equal and does not hold, for there is nothing to prevent the work of the one being better than that of the other. They must therefore be equated. And this is true of the other arts also, for they would have been destroyed if what the patient suffered had not been just what the agent did, and of the same amount in kind. For it is not two doctors that associate for exchange, but a farmer and a doctor, or in general people who are different and unequal. But these must be equated. This is why all things that are exchanged must be somehow comparable. It is for this end that money has been introduced, and it becomes in a sense an intermediate, for it measures all things, and therefore the excess and the defect, how many shoes are equal to a house or to a given amount of food. The number of shoes exchanged for a house or for a given amount of food must therefore correspond to the ratio of builder to shoemaker. For if this be not so, there will be no exchange and no intercourse. And this proportion will not be effected unless the goods are somehow equal. All goods must therefore be measured by some one thing, as we said before. Now, this unit is in truth demand, which holds all things together. For if men did not need one another's goods at all, or did not need them equally, there would be either no exchange or not the same exchange. But money has become by convention a sort of representative of demand. And this is why it has the name money, because it exists not by nature, but by law, and it is in our power to change it and make it useless. There will, then, be reciprocity when the terms have been equated, so that as farmer is to shoemaker, the amount of the shoemaker's work is to that of the farmer's work for which it exchanges. But we must not bring them into a figure of proportion when they have already exchanged. Otherwise, one extreme will have both excesses, but when they still have their own goods. Thus, they are equals and associates just because this equality can be affected in their case. Let A be a farmer, C food, B a shoemaker, D his product equated to C. If it had not been possible for reciprocity to be thus effected, there would have been no association of the parties. That demand holds things together as a single unit is shown by the fact that when men do not need one another, in other words, when neither needs the other or one does not need the other, they do not exchange, as we do when someone wants what one has oneself. For example, when people permit the exportation of corn in exchange for wine. This equation therefore must be established, and for the future exchange, that if we do not need a thing now, we shall have it if ever we do need it. Money is, as it were, our surety. For it must be possible for us to get what we want by bringing the money. Now the same thing happens to money itself as to goods. It is not always worth the same, yet it tends to be steadier. This is why all goods must have a price set on them. For then there will always be exchange, and if so, association of man with man. Money, then, acting as a measure, makes goods commensurate and equates them. For neither would there have been association if there were not exchange, nor exchange if there were not equality, nor equality if there were not commensurability. Now, in truth, it is impossible that things differing so much should become commensurate, but with reference to demand, they may become so sufficiently. There must, then, be a unit, and that fixed by agreement, for which reason it is called money. For it is this that makes all things commensurate, since all things are measured by money. Let A be a house, B ten minai, C a bed. A is half of B, if the house is worth five minai, or equal to them. The bed, C, is a tenth of B. It is plain, then, how many beds are equal to a house, vis-a-vis -vis five. That exchange took place thus before there was money is plain. For it makes no difference whether it is five beds that exchange for a house, or the money value of five beds. We have now defined the unjust and the just. These having been marked off from each other, it is plain that just action is intermediate between acting unjustly and being unjustly treated. For the one is to have too much and the other to have too little. Justice is a kind of mean, but not in the same way as the other virtues, but because it relates to an intermediate amount while injustice relates to the extremes. And justice is that in virtue of which the just man is said to be a doer by choice of that which is just. 
and one who will distribute either between himself and another or between two others, not so as to give more of what is desirable to himself and less to his neighbor, and conversely with what is harmful, but so as to give what is equal in accordance with proportion, and similarly in distributing between two other persons. Injustice, on the other hand, is similarly related to the unjust, which is excess and defect, contrary to proportion, of the useful or hurtful. For which reason injustice is excess and defect, vis-a-vis -vis because it is productive of excess and defect. In one's own case, excess of what is in its own nature useful and, of de and defect of what is hurtful, while in the case of others it is as a whole like what it is in one's own case, but proportion may be violated in either direction. In the unjust act, to have too little is to be unjustly treated. To have too much is to act unjustly. Let this be taken as our account of the nature of justice and injustice, and similarly of the just and the unjust in general. Section 6. Since acting unjustly does not necessarily imply being unjust, we must ask what sort of unjust acts imply that the doer is unjust with respect to each type of injustice. For example, a thief, an adulterer, or a brigand. Surely the answer does not turn on the difference between these types. For a man might even lie with a woman knowing who she was, but the origin of his might be not deliberate choice, but passion. He acts unjustly then, but is not unjust. For example, a man is not a thief, yet he stole, nor an adulterer, yet he committed adultery, and similarly in all other cases. Now we have previously stated how the reciprocal is related to the just, but we must not forget that what we are looking for is not only what is just without qualification, but also political justice. This is found among men who share their life with a view to self-sufficiency, men who are free and either proportionately or arithmetically equal, so that between those who do not fulfill this condition, there is no political justice, but justice in a special sense and by analogy. For justice exists only between men whose mutual relations are governed by law, and law exists for men between whom there is injustice. For legal justice is the discrimination of the just and the unjust. And between men between whom there is injustice, there is also unjust action, though there is not injustice between all between whom there is unjust action. And this is assigning too much to oneself of things good in themselves and too little of things evil in themselves. This is why we do not allow a man to rule, but rational principle because a man behaves thus in his own interests and becomes a tyrant. The magistrate, on the other hand, is the guardian of justice, and if of justice, then of equality also. And since he is assumed to have no more than his share, if he is just, for he does not assign himself more of what is good in itself, unless such a share is proportional to his merits, so that it is for others that he labors. And it is for this reason that men, as we have previously stated, say that justice is another's good. Therefore, a reward must be given him, and this is honor and privilege. But those for whom such things are not enough become tyrants. The justice of a master and that of a father are not the same as the justice of citizens, though they are like it. For there can be no injustice in the unqualified sense towards things that are one's own. But a man's chattel, and his child until it reaches a certain age and sets up for itself are as it were part of himself, and no one chooses to hurt himself, for which reason there can be no injustice towards oneself. Therefore, the justice or injustice of citizens is not manifested in these relations, for it was as we saw according to the law, and between people naturally subject to law, and these as we saw are people who have an equal share in ruling and being ruled. Hence, justice can more truly be manifested towards a wife than towards children and chattels, for the former is household justice, but even this is different from political justice. Section 7. Of political justice, part is natural, part legal. Natural, that which everywhere has the same force and does not exist by people's thinking this or that. Legal, that which is originally indifferent, but when it has been laid down, it is not indifferent. For example, that a prisoner's ransom shall be amina or that a goat and not two sheep shall be sacrificed, and all the laws that are passed for particular cases. 
For example, that sacrifice shall be made in the honor of Bresidas, and the provisions of decrees. Now some think that all justice is of this sort, because that which is by nature is unchangeable and has everywhere the same force, as fire burns both here and in Persia, while they see change in the things recognized as just. This, however, is not true in this unqualified way, but is true in a sense. Or rather, with the gods, it is perhaps not true at all, while with us there is something that is just even by nature. Yet all of it is changeable. But still some is by nature, some not by nature. It is evident which sort of thing, among things capable of being otherwise, is by nature, and which is not but is legal and conventional, assuming that both are equally changeable. And in all other things the same distinction will apply. By nature the right hand is stronger, yet it is possible that all men should come to be ambidextrous. The things which are just by virtue of convention and expediency are like measures. For wine and corn measures are not everywhere equal, but larger in wholesale and smaller in retail markets. Similarly, the things which are just not by nature but by human enactment are not everywhere the same, since constitutions also are not the same, though there is but one which is everywhere by nature the best. Of things just and lawful, each is related as the universal to its particulars. For the things that are done are many, but of them each is one, since it is universal. There is a difference between the act of injustice and what is unjust, and between the act of justice and what is just. For a thing is unjust by nature or by enactment, and this very thing, when it has been done, is an act of injustice. But before it is done, it is not yet that, but is unjust. So too with an act of justice, though the general term is rather just action, an act of justice, is applied to the correction of the act of injustice. Each of these must later be examined separately with regard to the nature and number of its species and the nature of the things with which it is concerned. Section 8. Acts just and unjust being as we have described them, a man acts unjustly or justly whenever he does such acts voluntarily. When involuntarily, he acts neither unjustly nor justly except in an incidental way, for he does things which happen to be just or unjust. Whether an act is or is not one of injustice or of justice is determined by its voluntariness or involuntariness. For when is voluntary, it is blamed, and at the same time is then an act of injustice, so that there will be things that are unjust, yet not acts of injustice if voluntariness be not present at all. By the voluntary, I mean, as has been said before, any of the things in a man's own power which he does with knowledge. In other words, not in ignorance either of the person acted on, or of the instrument used, or of the end that will be attained. For example, whom he is striking, with what, and to what end. Each such act being done not incidentally, nor under compulsion. For example, if A takes B's hand and therewith strikes C, B does not act voluntarily, for the act was not in his own power. The person struck may be the striker's father, and the striker may know that it is a man or one of the persons present, but not know that it is his father. A similar distinction may be made in the case of the end, and with regard to the whole action. Therefore, that which is done in ignorance, or though not done in ignorance, is not in the agent's power, or is done under compulsion, is involuntary. For many natural processes, even, we knowingly both perform and experience, none of which is either voluntary or involuntary, for example, growing old or dying. But in the case of unjust and just acts alike, the injustice or justice may be only incidental. For a man might return a deposit unwillingly and from fear, and then he must not be said either to do what is just or to act justly, except in an incidental way. Similarly, the man who under compulsion and unwillingly fails to return the deposit must be said to act unjustly, and to do what is unjust only incidentally. Of voluntary acts, we do some by choice, others not by choice. By choice those which we do after deliberation, not by choice those which we do without previous deliberation. Thus, there are three kinds of injury in transactions between man and man. Those done in ignorance are mistakes when the person acted upon, 
The act, the instrument, or the end that will be attained is other than the agent supposed. The agent thought either that he was not hitting anyone, or that he was not hitting with this missile, or not hitting with this person or to this end, but as a result followed other than that which he thought likely. For example, he threw not with intent to wound, but only to prick. Or the person hit or the missile was other than he supposed. Now when, one, the injury takes place contrary to reasonable expectation, it is a misadventure. When, two, it is not contrary to reasonable expectation, but does not imply vice, it is a mistake. For a man makes a mistake when the fault originates in him, but is the victim of accident when the origin lies outside him. When three, he acts with knowledge, but not after deliberation, it is an act of injustice. For example, the acts due to anger or to other passions necessary or natural to men. For when men do such harmful and mistaken acts, they act unjustly, and the acts are acts of injustice. But this does not imply that the doers are unjust or wicked, for the injury is not due to vice. But when, for, a man acts from choice, he is an unjust man and a vicious man. Hence, acts proceeding from anger are rightly judged not to be done of malice aforethought. For it is not the man who acts in anger, but he who enraged him that starts the mischief. Again, the matter in dispute is not whether the thing happened or not, but its justice. For it is apparent injustice that occasions rage. For they do not dispute about the occurrence of the act, as in commercial transactions, where one of the two parties must be vicious, unless they do so owing to forgetfulness. But, agreeing about the fact, they dispute on which side justice lies, whereas a man who has deliberately injured another cannot help knowing that he has done so, so that the one thinks he is being treated unjustly and the other disagrees. But if a man harms another by choice, he acts unjustly, and these are the acts of injustice which imply that the doer is an unjust man provided that the act violates proportion or equality. Similarly, a man is just when he acts justly by choice, but he acts justly if he merely acts voluntarily. Of involuntary acts, some are excusable, others not. For the mistakes which men make not only in ignorance, but also from ignorance, are excusable. While those which men do from, not from ignorance, but, though they do them in ignorance, owing to a passion which is neither natural nor such as man is liable to, are not excusable. Section 9. Assuming that we have sufficiently detailed the suffering and doing of injustice, it may be asked, one, whether the truth is expressed in Euripides' paradoxical words. I slew my mother, that's my tale in brief, were you both willing or unwilling both? Is it truly possible to be willingly treated unjustly, or is all suffering of injustice the contrary involuntary, as all unjust action is voluntary? And is all suffering of injustice of the latter kind, or else all of the former? Or is it sometimes voluntary, sometimes involuntary? So too, with the cases being justly treated. All just action is voluntary, so that it is reasonable that there should be a similar opposition in either case. That both being unjustly and being justly treated should be either alike voluntary or alike involuntary. But it would be thought paradoxical even if the case of being justly treated, if it were always voluntary, for some are unwillingly treated justly. One might raise this question also, whether everyone who has suffered what is unjust is being unjustly treated, or, on the other hand, it is with suffering as with acting. In action and in passivity alike, it is possible to partake of justice incidentally. And similarly, it is plain of injustice. For to do what is unjust is not the same as to act unjustly, nor to suffer what is unjust as to be treated unjustly. And similarly, in the case of acting justly and being justly treated. For it is impossible to be unjustly treated if the other does not act unjustly or justly treated unless he acts justly. Now, if to act unjustly is simply to harm someone voluntarily, and voluntarily means knowing the person acted upon, the instrument, and the manner of one's acting, and the incontinent man voluntarily harms himself, not only will he voluntarily be unjustly treated, but it will be possible to treat oneself unjustly. This also is one of the questions in doubt, whether a man can treat himself unjustly. 
Again, a man may voluntarily, owing to incontinence, be harmed by another who acts voluntarily, so that it would be possible to be voluntarily treated unjustly. Or is our definition incorrect? Must we, to harming another, with knowledge both of the person acted upon, of the instrument, and of the manner, add, contrary to the wish of the person acted upon? Then a man may be voluntarily harmed and voluntarily suffer what is unjust, but no one is voluntarily treated unjustly, for no one wishes to be unjustly treated, not even the incontinent man. He acts contrary to his wish, for no one wishes for what he does not think to be good, but the incontinent man does do things that he does not think he ought to do. Again, one who gives what is his own, as Homer says Glaucus gave Diomede, armor of gold for brazen, the price of a hundred thebes for nine, is not unjustly treated. For though to give is in his power, to be unjustly treated is not. But there must be some one to treat him unjustly. It is plain, then, that being unjustly treated is not voluntary. Of the questions we intended to discuss, two still remain for discussion. Three, whether it is the man who is assigned to another more than his share that acts unjustly, or he who has the excessive share, and four, whether it is possible to treat oneself unjustly. The questions are connected, for if the former alternative is possible, and the distributor acts unjustly, and not the man who has the excessive share, then if a man assigns more to another than to himself, knowingly and voluntarily, he treats himself unjustly, which is what modest people seem to do, since the virtuous man tends to take less than his share. Or does this statement, too, need qualification? For A, he perhaps gets more than his share of some other good, for example, of honor or of intrinsic nobility. B, the question is solved by applying this distinction we applied to unjust action, for he suffers nothing contrary to his own wish, so that he is not unjustly treated as far as this goes, but at most only suffers harm. It is plain, too, that the distributor acts unjustly, but not always the man who has the excessive share. For it is not he to whom what is unjust appertains that acts unjustly, but he to whom it appertains to do the unjust act voluntarily. In other words, the person in whom lies the origin of the action, and this lies in the distributor, not in the receiver. Again, since the word do is ambiguous, and there is a sense in which lifeless things, or a hand, or a servant who obeys an order, may be said to slay, he who gets an excessive share does not act unjustly, though he does what is unjust. Again, if the distributor gave his judgment in ignorance, he does not act unjustly in respect of legal justice, and his judgment is not unjust in this sense, but in a sense, it is unjust, for legal justice and primordial justice are different. But if with knowledge he judged unjustly, he is himself aiming at an excessive share either of gratitude or of revenge. As much, then, as if he were to share in the plunder, the man who has judged unjustly for these reasons has got too much. The fact that what he gets is different from what he distributes makes no difference. For even if he awards land with a view to sharing the plunder, he gets not land but money. Men think that acting unjustly is in their power, and therefore that being just is easy. But it is not. To lie with one's neighbor's wife, to wound another, to deliver a bribe is easy in our power. But to do these things as a result of a certain state of character is neither easy nor in our power. Similarly, to know what is just and what is unjust requires, men think, no great wisdom. Because it is not hard to understand the matters dealt with by the laws. Though these are not the things that are just, except incidentally. But how actions must be done and distributions effected in order to be just, to know this is a greater achievement than knowing what is good for the health. Though even there, while it is easy to know that honey, wine, hellebore, cautery, and the use of the knife are so, to know how, to whom, and when these should be applied with a view to producing health, is no less an achievement than that of being a physician. Again, for this very reason, men think that acting unjustly is characteristic of the just man no less than of the unjust, because he would be not less, but even more capable of doing each of these unjust acts. For he could lie with a woman or wound a neighbor, 
and the brave man could throw away his shield and turn to fight in this direction or in that. But to play the coward or to act unjustly consists not in doing these things except incidentally, but in doing them as the result of a certain state of character, just as to practice medicine and healing consists not in applying or not applying the knife, in using or not using medicines, but in doing so in a certain way. Just acts occur between people who participate in things good in themselves and can have too much or too little of them. For some beings, for example, presumably the gods, cannot have too much of them. And to others, those who are incurably bad, not even the smallest share in them is beneficial, but all such goods are harmful. While to others they are beneficial up to a point. Therefore, justice is essentially something human. Section 10. Our next subject is equity and the equitable, and their respective relations to justice and the unjust. For on examination, they appear to be neither absolutely the same nor generically different. And while we sometimes praise what is equitable and the equitable man, so that we apply the name by way of praise even to instances of the other virtues, instead of good meaning by epiai kestebon, that a thing is better, at other times, when we reason it out, it seems strange if the equitable, being something different from the just, is yet praiseworthy. For either the just or the equitable is not good if they are different. Or if both are good, they are the same. These, then, are pretty much the considerations that give rise to the problem about the equitable. They are all, in a sense, correct and not opposed to one another. For the equitable, though it is better than one kind of justice, yet is just, and it is not as being a different class of thing that it is better than the just. The same thing, then, is just and equitable. And while both are good, the equitable is superior. What creates the problem is that the equitable is just, but not the legally just, but a correction of legal justice. The reason is that all law is universal, but about some things it is not possible to make a universal statement, which shall be correct. In those cases, then, in which it is necessary to speak universally, but not possible to do so correctly, the law takes the usual case, though it is not ignorant of the possibility of error. And it is nonetheless correct, for the error is in the law, nor in the legislator, but in the nature of the thing, since the matter of practical affairs is of this kind from the start. When the law speaks universally, then, and a case arises on it which is not covered by the universal statement, then it is right. Where the legislator fails us and has erred by oversimplicity to correct the omission, to say what the legislator himself would have said had he been present, and would have put into his law if he had known. Hence the equitable is just, and better than one kind of justice. Not better than absolute justice, but better than the error that arises from the absoluteness of the statement. And this is the nature of the equitable, a correction of law where it is defective owing to its universality. In fact, this is the reason why all things are not determined by law, that about some things it is impossible to lay down a law so that a decree is needed. For when the thing is indefinite, the rule also is indefinite, like the leaden rule used in making the lesbian molding. The rule adapts itself to the shape of the stone, it is not rigid, and so too the decree is adapted to the facts. It is plain, then, what the equitable is, and that it is just and is better than one kind of justice. It is evident also from this who the equitable man is. The man who chooses and does such acts, and is no stickler for his rights in a bad sense, but tends to take less than his share, though he has the law oft his side, is equitable. In this state of character is equity which is a sort of justice and not a different state of character. Section 11. Whether a man can treat himself unjustly or not is evident from what has been said. For A, one class of just acts are those acts in accordance with any virtue which are prescribed by the law. For example, the law does not expressly permit suicide, and what it does not expressly permit, it forbids. Again, when a man in violation of the law harms another, otherwise than in retaliation, voluntarily, he acts unjustly. And a voluntary agent is one who knows both the person he is affecting by his action and the instrument he is using. And he who through anger voluntarily stabs himself does this contrary to the right rule of life. And this the law does not allow. 
Therefore, he is acting unjustly. But towards whom? Surely towards the state, not towards himself. For he suffers voluntarily, but no one is voluntarily treated unjustly. This is also the reason why the state punishes. A certain loss of civil rights attaches to the man who destroys himself, on the ground that he is treating the state unjustly. Further, B, in that sense of acting unjustly, in which the man who acts unjustly is unjust only, and not bad all round, it is not possible to treat oneself unjustly. This is different from the former sense. The unjust man, in one sense of the term, is wicked in a particularized way, just as the coward is, not in the sense of being wicked all around, so that his unjust act does not manifest wickedness in general. For that would imply the possibility of the same things having been subtracted from and added to the same thing at the same time. But this is impossible. The just and the unjust always involve more than one person. Further, unjust action is voluntary and done by choice and takes the initiative, for the man who, because he has suffered, does the same in return, is not thought to act unjustly. But if a man harms himself, he suffers and does the same things at the same time. Further, if a man could treat himself unjustly, he could be voluntarily treated unjustly. Besides, no one acts unjustly without committing particular acts of injustice. But no one can commit adultery with his own wife or housebreaking on his own house or theft on his own property. In general, the question, can a man treat himself unjustly, is solved also by the distinction we apply to the question, can a man be voluntarily treated unjustly? It is evident, too, that both are bad, being unjustly treated and acting unjustly. For the one means having less and the other having more than the intermediate amount, which plays the part here that the healthy does in the medical art and that good condition does in the art of bodily training. But still, acting unjustly is the worse, for it involves vice and is blameworthy. It involves vice which is either of the complete and unqualified kind, or almost so. We must admit the latter alternative, because not all voluntary unjust action implies injustice as a state of character. While being unjustly treated does not involve vice and injustice in oneself. In itself, then, being unjustly treated is less bad, but there is nothing to prevent its being incidentally a greater evil. But theory cares nothing for this. It calls pleurisy a more serious mischief than a stumble. Yet, the latter may become incidentally the more serious, if the fall due to it leads to your being taken prisoner or put to death the enemy. Metaphorically and in virtue of a certain resemblance, there is a justice, not indeed between a man and himself, but between certain parts of him. Yet not every kind of injustice, but that of master and servant, or that of husband and wife. For these are the ratios in which the part of the soul that has a rational principle stands to the irrational part. And it is with a view to these parts that people also think a man can be unjust to himself, vis-a-vis -vis because these parts are liable to suffer something contrary to their respective desires. There is therefore thought to be a mutual justice between them as ruler and ruled. Let this be taken as our account of justice and the other, in other words, the other moral virtues.